All right, today is Monday, um, March 30th. Our goal today is going to be to start our second uh, organ system, and that is going to be the urinary system anatomy uh, that we'll focus on for today. <clears throat> but there are a couple other things that I wanted to, let me go ahead and remove those hands marks right now. Things that I wanted to talk about, uh, let's talk about the fun stuff first. Uh, by a quick uh, yes or no on the uh, participation, how many people uh, were able to actually do uh, both activities on that take home respiration lab? All right, well, how about one? How many people were able to do one, at least one of the activities? All right, well, everybody else is either still asleep or uh, slowly working their way into this. All right, excellent. Well, hopefully hopefully that was uh, at least somewhat uh, informative and interesting or at least fun uh, for you to be able to do that. Those of you who didn't, hopefully you at least completed it as a thought experiment like we talked about. All right, the other thing that I want to talk about today before we get started is to talk about the exam format. Uh, after having our, as I mentioned on Friday, we had a department meeting uh, where a lot of things were discussed and then also with the continuing information that comes out uh, with the government currently saying now that they want to maintain this uh, social distancing, this isolation until uh, the end of April. Uh, while again, no official word, um, well, no official word has come out yet uh, from American River College, I think the expectation is that we are going to probably be here through April. Uh, with that, uh, then the expectation is that we will be doing our exam, uh, both the lab and lecture exams uh, that are gonna be April 15th, we'll be doing it online. Um, with uh, that in mind, I have the new classroom policies uh, based on uh, the department meeting and things that we've talked about, uh, what the expectations are going to be moving forward. Hopefully those expectations uh, make sense to you and uh, are acceptable to you. If not, as I mentioned, uh, there are uh, several options that are available to you. Uh, the easiest option uh, that is gonna be available is to have the opportunity to, if, if, if you are either unwilling or not capable, and again, some of it could be that you don't have the correct uh, materials or uh, resources to be able to complete the class using this new format, uh, and some people may not want to. If you don't want to be recorded, again, you guys did not sign up for an online class. I didn't sign up for teaching an online class, but uh, this is what we've been stuck with in this situation. If it is something you're not comfortable doing, uh, then there are really two main options. One of the things that the university, in fact, all of the community colleges of, of California have allowed is for what they're calling an excused withdrawal. And that excused withdrawal will give you a full refund for all of your tuition that is out of pocket. Uh, it does not count as a, um, it will not account affect, uh, it should not affect your financial aid or anything along those lines. It won't affect your GPA, it'll go away completely once you retake the class and everything that goes along with that. My understanding, although I still have not been able to get a 100% confirmed uh, for this information, but it is my understanding and expectation that it also will not count as one of your three attempts at taking this class as well. I've been told that is likely to be the case, but I will warn you that it hasn't been 100% confirmed that that is going to be the case, but I would highly expect that to be the situation. The other option that you do have available to you would be to take an incomplete. Uh, with an incomplete, what that would mean is basically your grade would be frozen where you are right now. And then if and when we get back, well, not if, when we get back on campus of whenever that is, uh, then you would have the opportunity to complete it. Typically with incompletes, you have one year to complete all of the missing activities. Uh, the challenge with an incomplete is that um, you cannot re-enroll in the class. It also has some effects on, uh, on, on financial aid. It can also affect your ability to be able to do things like um, 
sign up for other classes or it can impact things in other ways. Uh, so again, I don't know how viable that an, op that an option is for people, but it is those things that uh, you can think about. Uh, the other thing that I've set up for you to help you to make this decision is I have put a very stupid, a very simple, a very basic uh, practice le uh, lecture exam or lab exam really would be the format for this. Uh, practice exam. And really, basically, this test is just an opportunity for you to uh, experience what uh, the protocols will be for the testing moving forward and make sure that your system is compatible with it. Um, the questions are completely meaningless and stupid, uh, and that was on purpose. What I will say is that there will be a slight difference in the format for the lab and lecture exams, uh, so I did want to talk about that a little bit. Um, what as it as it shows here on um, Wednesday, April fifteenth, what will happen is on those day on that day, both the lab and the lecture exam will be made available online starting at seven a.m. in the morning. Uh, you have the option of taking them in whatever order you want. So unlike the classroom where you have to take the lab first and then you have to take the lecture, you may take them in whatever order it is that you want. Uh, they must be completed between the time of 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, one of the important things to remember is that means it has to be completed. Uh, I had a problem with a student in my 430 class. Remember, they had to take an online one, and that one was kind of rushed and had slightly different formats, but some of, the consist uh, some of the characteristics were consistent. And I had a student who tried to start the exam three minutes before the exam ended. So they got three minutes into the exam, and then the exam closed. So obviously, they did not do well on that question. So uh, be aware of that. They will be available starting at 7 a.m. It must be completed by 2. Uh, the longest amount of time you would have for these exams is going to be one hour. Uh, so uh, for that, make sure you're starting before 1. And again, the, the, all the information will be on the exams when they're posted, so you know what to expect from that uh, when it starts. So make sure you give yourself enough time to complete them within the time they are allowed. As you see, this time is, uh, includes all of our normal class time and a little bit of extra time to give you plenty of flexibility to be able to find the time to do that. The questions will be similar to what you see on the practice exam. Obviously, the content will be very, very different. Uh, but the difference, uh, the format for both the lab and the lecture exam is going to be slightly different. Both are going to be timed exams where you'll have a limited amount of time to do them. However, the lab exam is going to present one question at a time. You will answer that question. Once you answer that question and move forward, uh, you cannot go back to the previous question. So it will be similar to what we do in the uh, timed lab exams, the PowerPoint presentations uh, in the classroom. We are presented one question at a time, one image at a time, uh, and then you answer that question and you move on to the next. Uh, you, uh, unlike the classroom where you have X amount of time per question, that's not gonna be the case here. The timer is for the entire test, so you are going to have to self-monitor your time. Uh, so you're gonna, if you know that there are, and again, let's just say for simple stakes, 60 questions and you have 60 minutes to take it, then what you have to realize is you have to allocate about a minute per question. Uh, so that if you, uh, you know, are at question 10 and you're three minutes in, then you're doing great on time. In fact, you're rushing and you're going to be okay. So maybe you should slow down to make sure you're answering them correctly. However, if you're at question 10 and you're 40 minutes in, then you're obviously you're doing it wrong. So you, you're going to need to self-monitor. There is a timer that does show you how things are going. Although if that timer does freak you out, you can remove it or, or, or hide it, but just be aware of the fact that the timer uh, is for the entire exam, not per question. So you need to advance it as you go through that. All right, um, once time through, unlike the ones that work, I mean, at school. So again, you will take your time, go through one question at a time and answer it that way. For the lecture exam though, however, there will be uh, questions and I haven't decided if there will be multiple choice questions or not, but there will definitely be essay questions and you will be presented with all of those questions at once. So all of them will be on the screen. Uh, you can look at them all and answer them all in your own sequence, in your own order. You can start them and go back to one or something along those lines, and then you submit it all at once. That is more like what we have with our normal lecture exam as well, where you have the whole entire exam to be able to look at, and you can be thinking about one question while you're answering the other. 
Uh, that format just isn't practical for a lab exam, it, these lab exams. And again, with two organ systems, we're going to have a lot of anatomy. There could be somewhere 60, 70 questions on this lab exam. So trying to have a lab exam where all 70 questions all populate on the screen at once, and some of these images can be quite large, uh, that can be incredibly taxing and, and it can slow the computer down. It can cause major issues that way. So just from a format standpoint, the lab exam will be one question at a time but the lecture exam will be all the questions at once. So the, the practice exam that is set up is the format of what our lab exam would be, where you get one question at a time, you have to answer that question, you then move on to the next question, uh, and again, um, can't go back. So that is gonna be the format for those. Uh, let me see, there are a couple questions here. <coughs> Uh, I have not written these exams yet. I've been mostly working on the format and stuff. My guess though, as I said, because there is going to be um, two organ systems, my guess, and again, there's a fair amount of anatomy, fair amount of histology. Um, my guess is probably somewhere around 70 questions, maybe 60 to 70 questions on the lab exam. What is the reason for not letting us to go back to review our answers on the lab exam? Uh, really, it's uh, again, the problem with it is the timing of it and the logistics of it. Uh, it, with the presenting of one question at a time, uh, if you have to, and because the time that it takes to populate that information to the screen, if you're trying to go back 15 questions, it can be an incredibly slow and laborious process and can run out of time very easily that way. So it's just uh, in, for the logistics of getting students to be able to get through the exam and answer the questions in the time allotted, uh, just uh, not allowing the students to go back, not allowing you to go back on the test is, is the most efficient way to do that, to present the information and go forward. Uh, as far as the timing for them, I don't uh, know what the time will, de will definitely be based on how many questions that there are. So for the um, for the lab exam, uh, because it's just one question one time through, you'll probably have somewhere between 45 seconds and a minute per question to be able to really think about and look at it and come up with that. That is more than enough time for that, uh, as we've seen when we do that on the, um, in the classroom. Uh, no, you will not be able to review all the answers before submitting it. You have to, again, one question at a time, one answer at a time as you go through the lab exam for that. The lecture exam, uh, how much time will be available for that will be based on, on again, how many questions there are and, and how much time I think is appropriate for that. Uh, it'll probably be a slightly smaller exam than the ones we have in the classroom. So my guess is that probably it wouldn't be more than, you know, wouldn't be more than two hours. Uh, it, dep it really depends on how many questions are going to be. If it's just all essay questions, then it may be closer to an hour, an hour and a half, or it could be two hours. But yeah, the time will definitely be based on, uh, on how many questions there are. And since I haven't written the test, I don't know how long they were going to be. Um, will the great exams be graded on the curve? It depends again on the size of the exams. If they are a normal 100 point uh, lecture exam, for instance, then uh, likely, yes, then I will curve them uh, for that uh, in that fashion. Uh, and the same thing for the lab exam. It depends on the size of it. The issue is, like I said, for, uh, and again, I will use the example of the 430 class because I had to give an exam on that. But remember that exam was, was two days after we found out we were going to be online. <clears throat> and I had to rush to get it done. So one of the things that I did is it was a much smaller exam. Both the lab and the lecture exam were only 50 points. And with a 50 point exam, I can't curve that on top of that. So again, it becomes, because then when it gets down to the test that's, you know, 42 points or something, or I think the top grade was actually 48, but even still, um, curving it with a 50 point exam just starts to make the points practically meaningless at that point. But these should be closer to the full size exams. And so, yes, the expectation is that they should be curved the same way the other ones will be as well. All right, so any questions on that? That is gonna be the format if you haven't. And again, as of last night, I saw not a lot of people have done that yet. You have till Friday to really, again, like I said, the whole point of this practice exam is just to test uh, your um, resources to make sure that you are capable of taking a test this way and for you to decide if you want to continue with the class and take tests this way. So that you, because this is how the tests are going to be. So you have that opportunity to experience that and see what that would be like and see if that is something that you want to partake in. And, uh, um, and if you'd complete that by Friday, I think Friday at uh, 
I don't remember what it said, six or 10 or whatever time it is, uh, you'll get five points of extra credit for doing that. So you do get that as well. All right, so any, <clears throat> excuse me, any other questions on uh, the exam and the format and what that expectations are going to be like? Okay, the other thing that I wanted to mention is again, uh, next week, so we will have lecture today. We will have lecture on Wednesday. And then next week what was our spring break. We are still having an official spring break, so there will be no formal lectures during that time. However, I do want you to be active in the learning process, especially because when we come back from this, uh, you have lab and lecture exams on two organ systems when we come back. So while I will not have, be holding any formal lectures, I will do two hours of office hours on Monday and on uh, Wednesday. Again, there's no reason for us to get up early on those days because it's spring break. So I will be on my computer because in all likelihood, I'll be working on my exams during that time and we'll be on my computer anyway. So uh, definitely from 10 to 12 on Monday and Wednesday. So on both of those days, instead of lecture, I will have office hours. So if there's any questions or any concerns or any other things that you guys uh, have, uh, want to speak with me about, and again, you can always get a hold of me by email. And I'm always just good at responding by that. We can make re uh, uh, appointments outside of the normal class time to meet or even meet in Zoom to go over that. I've had a couple of students who, who wanted to talk about their previous exams or had questions on other things, and I'm happy to help with those things as well. Uh, but uh, this formally will be uh, office hours that will be on the computer. I'll be on in the Zoom classroom. I'll have it up while I work on things so that if anybody wants to come in and have any questions, they're welcome to ask that. I will not be recording those, uh, So, um, but uh, if we, you come in and ask questions, you're of course welcome to record that, to keep it for yourself as well. All right, so that is our game plan, uh, other than to talk about the things that we have to do. Like I said, we start our urinary system discussion today, uh, at focusing like we did with the respiratory on the anatomy first. And then we will be switching to the physiology on Wednesday and then the following Monday when we come back. You have three assignments uh, that are gonna be due for this section. Uh, your unit 25 review uh, is due on Wednesday and that is on the anatomy. Uh, your unit uh, 26 review is due after spring break on the 13th uh, when we come back. And also on the 13th, uh, Again, uh, we uh, have a urinalysis at a lab that we would normally do in the classroom, uh, but I will tell you right now, it isn't a fun one. It's not like you get to test your own urine. It's actually artificial urine. Uh, so it's uh, basically no different from what you're gonna be doing in the Physio X. So the Physio X exercise nine has six activities. You're gonna do that. That's your big physiology component for this and uh, you'll be spending the time looking at that and doing that activity, it's all six activities. Uh, so again, don't save it for the night before, because uh, again, it's not hard, it's just long. And those are due on the 13th when we come back as well. <clears throat> Alrighty, any questions on any of that? That is our game plan. I know that's a lot of coverage of a lot of material uh, for the first 20 minutes of class, and we haven't gone over any information yet about what we're covering in class, but I think it is important that we understand the process of what we're gonna do going forward. Um, there is hope that, that things will, uh, will level out, will we'll flatten the curve, and possibly we could be back at the beginning of May, uh, just in time to finish things off and have our finals, and that would be amazing and awesome. Uh, but we will, uh, the expectation now is that we'll be here. And again, I, I, I want to emphasize that the uh, frustratingly, although I guess I haven't checked my email this morning, uh, but frustratingly, the, uh, the campus has not said anything officially about a return date yet. So, uh, but based on all the information coming out from the White House and everything else, um, then I think that we are going to uh, be taking our first exam online and that's going to be on the 16th so i think we need to plan for that or pardon me 15th so we need to plan for that and prepare for that and uh, so like i said so that's why the policies are stated so that everybody clearly understands uh what we're going to be doing you should have gotten those in the email and they're the home page now of our uh, canvas site 
And then, like I said, please, please, please uh, do it for the five points of extra credit, but more importantly, uh, take the practice test so that you have the opportunity to see what that's going to be like. And again, it's going to take you literally two minutes to complete it. So it's more about just getting on there and seeing what it's going to be like, making sure your system is compatible uh, with uh, the Proctorio system, proctoring system, so that uh, we can get uh, have secure exams so that they can be meaningful exams. Uh, with meaningful points that can help you to uh, to get the grade that you want and most importantly to make sure that you understand uh, this information. As we talked about last week, there's a tremendous onus on you in this format to be successful. Uh, in this online environment when you're at home, it is potentially easier to cheat on these exams. Uh, and yes, that gets you the short-term uh, gain of getting the grade that you may want to help you to move forward. But the vast majority of you that are in this class are in this because you want to be using this information going forward, whether it's to nursing or kinesiology or whatever field it is. And when you do that, all you're doing is cheating yourself and eventually that's gonna come back to bite you. You know, one of the things that I, well, like's not the right word, but one of the responsibilities that I see for myself in this class is to start to weeding out those uh, those students who uh, aren't capable of being successful of this. And 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 uh, there is a satisfaction in in catching someone who cheats and stopping them from being successful in that environment. And this uh, online environment makes that more challenging. But what you ultimately have to remember is that uh, eventually we'll catch up with you. For most of you in the fields that you're going into, you need to know this information. So taking shortcuts now just hurts you in the long term. So make sure you remember that. Like I said, the onus for your learning is shifting uh, more towards you than ever before in this class. I give you a lot of responsibility in the first, uh, in the second semester. All right, baby bird you a little bit in first semester, and so there's some challenges there. But in this one, really, the onus has been on you from the beginning, especially for the anatomy. But it's even more so now. So make sure you stay with this uh, to help yourself to be successful, because you're going to need this stuff going forward. All righty, off my soapbox. Any questions on any of that uh, before we dive in? All right, excellent. So that is our introduction. Why is my mouse not working? Oh, there it is. All right, perfect. All right, let's switch gears then and talk about the urinary system. Uh, our goal is to talk about the urinary system. Again, this is our next organ system. And like the respiratory system, uh, it has uh, some similarities in the way that it is gonna help us to uh, deal with uh, processing the condition of the blood. The respiratory system uh, primarily is about the gases, getting them in and out and transporting them. Uh, but remember, we also talked about that relationship with carbon dioxide and its relationship with water, how it produces that acid. And so uh, there's also about maintaining the conditions of the blood as well. The urinary system is probably the worst named of all of the systems. Obviously, it's called the urinary system because the most obvious uh, fact about it is the fact that we produce and uh, void urine from our body. But again, you got to remember the goal of it isn't to uh, produce urine. The goal of it is actually to filter our blood. And to do that requires two sets of organs. Right? When we talked about the, well, when we will talk about the digestive system, if you grab some random person on the street, which legally you're not allowed to do anymore, uh, but if back in ancient times you were able to grab someone on the street and ask them to identify an organ in the digestive system, most people would say stomach. Stomach has that rock star status. Uh, but when we talk about the digestive system, as we'll learn, it's not really warranted. The stomach really doesn't do anything vital. There's actually only one thing our stomach does that is vital to our existence, uh, and it's only partially related to digestion. However, when it comes to our urinary system, right, the kidneys are indeed the rock stars. They are the functional component of this. Uh, it is their job to be able to filter and process the blood. Right? One of the things that we've talked about in this class is that life is lazy. Right? Again, not every system is necessarily completely optimized, 
Instead, things are just good enough. And once the body knows how to do something, it's satisfied with that. Right? Uh, you could survive with one eye, right? But you probably wouldn't be able to be a wide receiver because uh, your depth perception problems would be an issue. You could survive with one lung, but you probably couldn't be a wide receiver in the NFL with that because you wouldn't be able to get enough oxygen into your body. However, if you lost a kidney or sold it on eBay, would you be able to be a wide receiver in the NFL? Would it affect your function at all? No. No, it wouldn't. Absolutely not. Now, again, you might not want to still be it, but you could be a professional athlete with just one kidney. One kidney is capable of doing all of the filtering necessary for your blood. If you, uh, like I said, damaged and lost a kidney, uh, donated a kidney, sold it on eBay, whatever it is, your remaining kidney would enlarge slightly, uh, but it still would be able to do all the filtering necessary to be able to, to allow you to survive and function at an optimal level. Of course, if you then lost or damaged the second kidney, all right, what's the prognosis then? How long can you survive with no kidneys? Well, I'll tell you, not very long. Exactly, you can't, right? Uh, dialysis is a short-term potential option, but even that is just a stopgate. It isn't a long-term solution. If you have problems with both of your kidneys, you will survive days at best and hopefully they can, you know, they can extend that with dialysis, but ultimately, eventually, you're going to need a kidney if you're going to survive long term. So that kidney and that kidney function is vital for what we do. The rest of the urinary system is basically just the urinary tract. Its job is to conduct and store the urine that is produced, the waste of this filtering of the blood. Again, the kidney's job is to process and filter the blood make the blood optimal for our conditions, for our functionality. And anything that is above and beyond that or any other types of waste and components are being drawn out. You are constantly filtering the blood. That means you are constantly producing urine, right? Every single person who's sitting here listening to me right now, you are urinating as we speak, right? Because urination means to produce urine. All of you are producing urine. Right. However, hopefully that urine isn't leaking out of your body while we speak right now. Although I guess technically we do have the advantage where you could be sitting in the bathroom while we're giving this lecture. But normally what happens is we produce that urine and then the urinary tract job is to house and store that until you get to a socially appropriate location. And once you get to that socially appropriate location, you can then void it. The urinary tract, including the ureters, and here's where's my pointy thing. There we go, including the ureters, the bladder, and the urethras. Sole job is to store that urine until we get to an appropriate location for avoiding to take place. There is absolutely positively no processing that takes place. All of the processing takes place in the kidneys. All these structures do, all the urinary tract does is just house and store it until it can be avoided. All the processing takes place in the kidney and only in the kidney. Now, like I said, the kidney is vital in its functions. One of the major functions, and again, really the key to remember is that the kidney's function is to process our blood. There are a couple ways that it does that. Uh, one of the major uh, functions is the excretion of wastes and other foreign substances. What we see here are a list of metabolic wastes, ammonia, uh, urea, which is a, a metabolic waste from the breakdown of amino acids, uh, bilirubin, uh, which as we know is from a breakdown of hemoglobin, creatine, uh, which is a metabolic waste of muscles, uric acid, a metabolic waste from the breakdown of nucleic acids. So we have all of these metabolic wastes and uh, primarily nitrogen-based wastes, and that's another big key here. Uh, that we have here with those. But it also plays a very important role in regulating our, our, our ionic composition. That was hard to say. 
our ionic composition, again, as we know, as we've talked about, um, what is in our blood and blood plasma is basically interchanged with our interstitial fluid, right? The fluid that surrounds the cells. And of course, that interstitial fluid that surrounds the cells affects our intracellular fluid, the cytoplasm on the inside of the cells. So obviously, what is going on in the blood affects every single part of the body. So we need to maintain the conditions of that interstitial fluid. Uh, for instance, we want high levels of sodium in it, in it and low levels of potassium, the right amount of calcium. We talked about how vitally important and how restrictive that range of calcium is. It's basically uh, eight and a half to 11 uh, milligrams per deciliter is the range we want calcium in. And again, they, they, you don't need to know those numbers. It's just in, impressive to see how tight that range is between eight and a half and 11. And all these other types of components as well. So we want to maintain our ionic composition of our blood because that affects the ionic composition of our interstitial fluid. We need to make sure we contain the right volume of blood. As we talked about in our cardiovascular system, the volume of blood uh, both directly and indirectly affects our blood pressure because the more blood we have, the more it, the blood pushes against the walls and so it can indirectly affect blood pressure. But we also can uh, use our uh, kidney and its kidney function to directly affect blood pressure as well. Our kidneys produce a hormone-like protein uh, notice it's not a hormone. We talked about hormones, but it is a protein that works very, very similar to a hormone, and that is renin. Uh, renin does a couple of important things that we will talk about, uh, but one of its effects, direct effects, is to uh, directly influence blood pressure. Oops, got to get rid of all those. The other important thing to remember is that one of the important things, and this is a concept we'll talk about a lot in this particular section, is osmolarity of the blood. Right? Osmolarity is a literally the count of the amount of stuff. So if I have a beaker and that beaker is filled with water, right, and I can put stuff into it. One of the stuff that I could put in it, for instance, would be salt. One of the things that I could put in it would be glucose, sugar. If I put, uh, and again, let's think of it this way, we'll go and use as much as I hate to, uh, math numbers. If I put one mole of salt into a beaker, and I put one mole of sugar into, oops, that's supposed to be a one, of sugar into a beaker. Do they have the same osmolarity? Give me a yes or no with the clickers on your participation. Come on, I'll wait. Yes or no, same osmolarity. Excellent, almost a perfect mix of yeses and nos. Um, anybody who say no want to explain to me why they say no? The mass of sugar being more than salt? So that definitely, absolutely, sugar has a larger mass. So this is indeed a bigger mass. Uh, but that's not actually why they'd be different. The correct answer is actually that they would be different, but it's not because of the bigger mass. Anybody else have a gander as to why it might be? Because sodium has also chloride, and for salt has sodium and chloride, so it's, two, it's a mixture more than Absolutely. sugar. Absolutely. Remember, osmolarity, and here's a key important thing to remember. Osmolarity is really, and let's actually cheat and do this. Right. Back in ancient times, hashtag used to be pound, which meant number, right? And so it's the number of stuff. Osmolarity is really just the measure of the number of things. Yes, sugar molecule has a bigger mass, but when we're just counting things, like if you were to count the things on your desk, right? I have the mouse, I have a pad of paper, and I have a laptop, 
right? And a microphone. So I have four things here. They're not all the same size, but each of those things is a thing. And that's all we're doing is we're measuring things. The key to salt is when you put salt in water, salt disassociates. It disassociates into a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And so one mole of salt is actually one mole of sodium and one mole of chloride. So, so when we put salt into the water, we would actually have two moles of stuff. Whereas when we put the sugar in, even though it has a bigger mass, it would just be one mole of stuff. So osmolarity is really about a measure of the amount of stuff that we have. And so osmolarity is the, and again, it doesn't matter what those things are, whether it is a teddy bear or whether it is an elephant, there's still one thing. And so really it's just a measure count of the amount of things. And those things, as we in Sacramento know better than most, if you were to drink mass amounts of water in a short period of time to try to win a video game system, right, as a result of that, you dramatically change the osmolarity of the blood. How much stuff is in it related to the water, and that affects our interstitial fluid. That change in interstitial fluid Uh, that change in interstitial fluid, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, then affects the uh, cells, causing the cells to uh, crinate, leading to uh, organ failure, leading ultimately to death. All right, so again, it is uh, the amount of stuff that we have, and that is very, very important. Another shared function that our kidneys have with our respiratory system that we just talked about is regulating blood pH. As we know, temperature and pH are things that proteins are highly, highly sensitive to. In the case of our uh, respiratory system, it was the fact that carbon dioxide becomes uh, carbonic acid and disassociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. So by controlling how much uh, CO2 is in the blood, we could affect how much hydrogen ions and how much bicarbonate is available in the blood and that would affect our pH. Well, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions are things that can be regulated in the blood by the kidneys as well. So what our kidneys are able to do is basically control how much hydrogen or bicarbonate it is. We can release hydrogen ions. We can hold on to bicarbonate ions. We can help to stabilize our blood pH by determining what things get released into our urine and what things get back into our cardiovascular system. Our kidney, remember, is one of the locations that we talked about that is capable of producing uh, steroid-based hormones. Uh, so there are lots of hormones that are produced by the kidneys. Uh, one of them that we talked about is erythropoietin. Uh, erythropoietin, remember, is the protein that helps to tell the uh, hemocytoblasts in our bone marrow to become the myeloid stem cells, and those myeloid stem cells then become the proerythroblasts. So we make more, uh, uh, more, more red blood cells, more uh, erythroblasts, which become more erythrocytes as a result of that. Uh, we talked about calcitriol. Remember, it's the active form of vitamin D. Uh, the, the kidney plays an important role in the production of that hormone as well, as well as, like we said, things like renin, which are not actual hormones, but uh, like to play hormones on TV. Lastly, if that isn't enough, another important function of our kidney is to help to regulate our glucose levels. As we talked about, obviously, our kidneys and, uh, pardon me, our liver and our pancreas play a huge role in helping us to regulate our blood glucose levels. Uh, our pancreas, by releasing insulin and glucagon, the hormones that help us to regulate our blood glucose levels. And we talked about the liver, and we'll talk about it in more depth when we get to the digestive system, is one of the places where we house a large amount of glucose to store that glucose for us to be able to help to maintain appropriate levels. However, if you are fasting, 
uh, for either, again, because uh, either cultural or religious reasons, uh, things along those lines, or maybe it's just because you're afraid to go out and go to the store. Uh, one of the things that can happen uh, with prolonged fasting is our kidneys actually have the ability to help to actually produce uh, some glucose. The way they do this is actually by taking the amino acid glutamine and they're actually able to use the amino acid glutamine and convert it into glucose. So, and again, in, in, in fasting type situations, our kidneys can actually try to help to maintain appropriate blood glucose levels by converting amino acids like glutamine into glucose in a process that is called gluconeogenesis. Right? Gluco, of course, refers to glucose, neogenesis, to give birth to. Uh, so again, it's one of those alphabet soup words you know you're going to have to spell at some point or another. Uh, but basically, it's converting that amino acid glutamine into glucose in fasting types of situations. All right, questions on that? All right, so that is our functions of the urinary system. Let's talk about the anatomy. Um, the kidney is located in the abdominal pelvic cavity. The abdominal pelvic cavity, as of course we know, is lined by a peritoneal membrane. And let's cheat a little bit and do some drawing. Here is our abdominal pelvic cavity. And uh, let's also cheat and put a circle here. Oops, no, not that. There, for instance, is an organ like our stomach or our small intestine. One of the things we know is that our abdominal pelvic cavity is lined by a serous membrane. How would we identify the specific serous membrane that lines the abdominal pelvic cavity? You know, it's been a long time. Parietal since you... peritoneum. There you go. Parietal oops. Peritone... Uh, peritoneum. Excellent. We have that parietal peritoneum there. We also know that our organs are lined by a serous membrane as well. That serous membrane is identical to the serous membrane that is out here. But because of its location, the fact that it is on the organ, we call it the visceral peritoneum. And do that. Do that. No, I'll put that there, that's fine. The visceral peritoneum as well. However, if we remember when we talked about our serous membranes. The serous membranes have to be connected. Uh, we saw this in the lungs. The visceral pleura and the parietal pleura connected to each other, and the same thing has to happen here as well. This is information we'll talk about in more depth when we get to the digestive system, which normally do first, so we have to cheat and talk a bit, little bit about it here. The way this actually works in the abdominal pelvic cavity is that what happens is that parietal peritoneum actually comes off the posterior wall of the abdominal pelvic cavity to wrap around the organs and then go back to the parietal uh, peritoneum uh, again. We call this little bit of a double layer of serous membrane, this double layer of the peritoneum that comes off the wall, we call it the mesentery. And so most of the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity are actually inside the abdominal pelvic cavity, what we call intraperitoneal. So our small intestine, uh, most of it, our stomach, our liver, our things like that are intraperitoneal. They're located in the abdominal pelvic cavity. However, and this is where I'm gonna have to cheat a little bit, 
there are a few organs and those few organs are actually located back here, kind of hidden behind that parietal peritoneum. These posterior organs that are located behind them are what we refer to as being retroperitoneal. And a great example of one of these retroperitoneal organs are, well, two great examples are the ones we're going to talk about today. And, uh, one, well, in the urinary system anyway. And those are the kidneys and the ureters. Both the kidneys and the ureters are actually behind the peritoneal cavity. Now, I've done an amazing job of drawing this here with my fancy, fancy picture. But if we actually uh, do this, we can actually see what this looks like in the real body. Here we have the parietal peritoneum forming the peritoneal cavity where all those intraperitoneal organs, like I said, like the liver, like the stomach, things like that are located. But notice the uh, posterior part of the parietal peritoneum doesn't actually line the wall of the parietal cavity. Instead, it goes over the top of some of the organs, like the aorta, like the inferior vena cava, and like the kidneys. So uh, here we actually, over the top, normally we think of the serous membrane that sits on top of an organ as being the visceral whatever. But in this case, it's actually behind the parietal. So this serous membrane that sits over the top of the kidney is what we call the parietal peritoneum. And it is behind the parietal cavity, so it is called retroperitoneal in its location. Notice then, it has its own little protective pocket. Normally we think of the serous membrane as something that holds organs in place. Uh, like the heart, like the kidneys, like the, I mean, pardon me, like the heart, like the lungs, like the small intestine. And again, one of the advantages of that is it allows for movement. That cheeseburger you had for breakfast can be moved around inside your stomach and your small intestine. Your lungs can expand and contract. Your heart can expand and contract. Serous membranes allow for that flexibility of movement. We don't want our kidneys moving around. They don't have to churn or move. There's no muscle in them uh, the way there is in the heart to pump the blood through it. So instead, we want them anchored and protected in place. And that's what we see here with their location. Notice they are located inside a pocket. And this pocket is formed, as we can see here, uh, by both the anterior and the posterior renal fascia. So we have this renal fascia uh, that forms a pocket that contains the kidney inside of it. So we have the anterior renal fascia and the posterior renal fascia that is formed by a uh, fibrous connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue forms this pocket. But notice, right, like if you are packaging up that vase to send it to grandma, you don't want to just stick it inside the box by itself, you want to cushion it. So notice there's a big, huge, massive layer of fat, this huge, big fat capsule, and in fact, that is what it is called, the fat capsule, uh, that is a large, massive amount of adipose tissue that sits around the kidney, supporting the kidney inside of that pocket that is formed by the renal fascia. This can be very important uh, when we look at extreme weight loss, right? Again, you're not happy with the way that you look, so you go to the uh, doctor and you have that stomach stapling process so that it limits the amount of food you have. Or because you're now at home and afraid to go shopping, you decide to have the popcorn diet where you have one kernel of popcorn for breakfast, another for lunch, and then a reasonable four kernels of popcorn for dinner. If you were to do that, would you lose weight as a result of that kind of a diet? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. However, as we talked about, uh, one of the things that would happen in that first, as we talked about back in 4.30, uh, if you remember, when you starve your body that way, uh, fat is a valuable resource. And so what ends up happening is your body holds on to the fat at first and starts breaking down muscle instead. 
But if you were to continue on that type of a diet for a prolonged period of time, yeah, you would lose a massive amount of fat and you would lose it very, very rapidly. The problem with that is where we want to lose the fat is in our subcutaneous place, uh, body locations, but we have fat everywhere in the body. And with extreme weight loss, one of the problems is while fat is very dynamic and has the ability to move throughout the body, different regions, uh, if you are extreme losing the, the fat very quickly, it's going to be lost in areas where you wouldn't necessarily want to lose it. And the kidneys is one of those areas. When people get those stomach stapling or do those banding types of uh, you know, surgeries and things along those lines, one of the things that they monitor on those people very, very carefully is their urine output. The reason for that, and we'll cheat and draw a kidney here from the side, is that that kidney has uh, that ureter that comes out of it to go to the bladder uh, to carry the urine out. What happens if you lose a massive amount of weight very, very rapidly is you can lose that adipose in that fat capsule. And as a result of that, what can actually happen is that your kidney can actually descend. It's no longer supported inside of that pocket and it descends as a result of that. It's a condition we call atosis. That ptosis is basically what happens when that kidney uh, descends as a result of the massive loss of weight and the loss of the fat in that fat capsule. The fact that the kidney is sitting a little lower is not a major concern. It may not be as anchored or protected by the ribs as it was anymore. But the more serious issue is the fact that a result of that can be that as the kidney descends, you can get a kinking of your ureter. And if you think of your garden hose, if you put a kink in your garden hose, what happens? Blocks it. Right, the water no longer flows through it. And so what happens is uh, the water, in this case, the urine would back up into the kidney. And when the urine backs up into the kidney, you see a dramatic increase in pressure as a result of that. And that increase in pressure in the kidney can actually damage the kidney very severely. So when they have those extreme like banding or stomach stapling, one of the things they do is they constantly are monitoring your urine output uh, to make sure that atosis of your kidney has not taken place. So we have our kidney locked up and protected uh, here in this retroperitoneal position uh, behind the wall. So of course we have the, uh, again, the renal fascia, which forms the pocket, the fat capsule inside of that, and then the parietal uh, peritoneum over the top. Oh, and then of course, uh, the kidney, like most organs, has its own candy-coated shell. And of course, that candy-coated shell on the outer surface of the kidney is what is known as the fibrous capsule. So we have a fat capsule and a fibrous capsule and a renal fascia. All right, questions on that? As I mentioned, it is retroperitoneal. Uh, notice also, as you can see, the kidneys are partially protected by the ribs. Again, they are vital in their function. So having them protected by the ribs is somewhat useful. However, notice, interestingly, the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney. Anyone know why might, that might be the case? What is your largest visceral organ? Liver or... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The liver. Absolutely. It is the liver. And so remember, if you're, uh, the liver is basically located in the upper right quadrant of the abdominal pelvic cavity. And so the massive liver that is located over here on the right kind of pushes the right kidney down a little bit. So it is more inferior uh, than the left kidney because of that displacement by the liver. Again, one of those asymmetries uh, to our bodies. Our kidney has uh, a kidney shape, uh, which is one we've seen a lot. But again, like the lungs, it has a convex outer surface, and then it has a concave region as well. And just like our kidney that uh, 
Oh, I like that big arrow. Just like our, uh, our, pardon me, just like our lung, the concave region of it is known as the hilum. And just like in the lungs, it is the hilum where structures enter into and come out of the kidney. So this is where the blood vessels, this is where the nerves, <coughs> excuse me, and this is where the ureters all enter into the kidney. More symmetry with our lungs. So we have that same type of shape where we have the convex outer surface, concave inner. That concave region is known as the hilum. And within that hilum is where all of our structures connect. So again, very similar anatomy to what we saw in our lung. Here, we get some nice views of it, of the kidney. Here we see a nice illustration, a couple nice illustrations, and an up close look at our functional structure that we're gonna talk about, which is the nephron. But let's talk about the gross anatomy of the kidney first. I'm gonna cheat and use my highlighter here uh, to emphasize these different regions. Uh, the first region of our kidney, and again, notice first, hold on before I do that. Uh, again, here on the out, we have that uh, renal uh, capsule. So this is the renal capsule, that candy-coated shell on the outer surface. Then as we look on the inside, we see an anatomy that we are fairly similar to, and that similar uh, is a uh, outer region and an inner region. And of course, when we have that kind of anatomy, the outer region, of course, is known as the cortex. The cortex is very granular in its appearance, uh, but the most important part of the cortex is the cortex is where we have other structures that are known as the change the thickness of my lines here, a nephron. The nephrons are the functional units of the kidney. Each kidney has over a million nephrons, and it is the nephrons that are responsible for filtering and processing the blood. So when we talk about the filtering and the processing of the blood, it is gonna be the nephrons that are responsible for doing that. Um, the second region is the medulla, right? So cortex on the out, medulla in the center. However, notice when we look at the medulla here, unlike other structures where we've seen it, like for instance, the adrenal gland, which sits on top, right? If you think about it, our adrenal gland sits on top of the kidney and it has the cortex on the outside and it has the medulla in the middle and the medulla was just a centrally located region. In this case, the medulla is compartmentalized into these pyramid-shaped structures. And not surprisingly, these pyramid-shaped structures are known as the medullary pyramids. The average kidney has somewhere between six and 18. And I will tell you right now, while everybody in the class uh, varies in the number of medullary pyramids they have, there does not seem to be any difference in function. So it's not like more pyramids meet better processing. It's just a, a morphological difference that doesn't seem to have any kind of major significance. One of the things that I do want you to note about this though, is that notice because they are compartmentalized, there is extensions of the cortex and these extensions of the cortex come down between the pyramids. And so when they come down between the pyramids like this, uh, these regions, as you can see, are what we refer to as the renal columns. So, and again, I could write it, but it says it right here. So notice these extensions out are the renal columns. And notice while we're here, if there are six to 18 pyramids, that also means that there are between six and 18 lobes to our kidney. A lobe 
is basically defined, uh, we'll use this, as a pyramid and the cortex that surrounds it, uh, both the outer cortex and the renal column as well. So notice, as you can see me highlighting here in yellow, this entire compartment surrounding. So basically, if you notice, it is the pyramid and the cortex that surrounds it is what we call the lobe. So not surprisingly, if we have six to 18 pyramids, we have between six and 18 lobes. That should make some semblance of sense. Um, one of the characteristics, and I have to cheat and do some erasing there, excellent. One of the unique characteristics about our pyramids, and one of the ways that you can tell them anatomically, is they have all of these distinct uh, grooves to them. Whereas the cortex is very granular, the cortex also has a massive amount of uh, blood vessels in them. Uh, what we see when you look at the pyramids is they have this striped appearance. The stripes go from the base of the pyramid to up towards the apex. So we see this striped appearance. And the reason for that is there are a massive number of tubules located within these pyramids, all carrying the fluid that is being processed to the apex of our pyramid. At the apex of the pyramid is where that fluid is released. And actually, once that fluid is released from our pyramid, at that point, it is no longer being processed. And once it reaches these tubules down here, we now essentially have urine. And for the first time is where we would call it urine. Up to this point, other than this, we are processing the fluid and we would call it filtrate. Uh, but once it reaches these tubules, now what we have is our urine that we are no longer processing. So these tubules continue that processing and it gives these pyramids a very distinct striped appearance. The apex of this, again, this is the apex, sticks out as a finger-like projection into this big, huge space at the center of our kidney and a finger-like extension. The term we use for that, of course, is the papilla. So the apex of our pyramid is that papilla. And here we see that there. And there you go, divided by the columns to form our lobes. And so again, as we mentioned, if you have six to 18 pyramids, then that means you have six to 18 lobes. All right, so far so good. We have identified the uh, cortex, we have identified the medulla, but notice, and again, I'll go back to my highlighter and cheat and change colors again. There is a space located in here. Notice this space isn't empty. This space, as we can see, has adipose in it. It has some blood vessels in it. Notice here they've left some of the space open to emphasize the fact that this is a space, but mostly that space is gonna be filled with fat. Part of that fat capsule is going to expend into this space. And of course, not surprisingly, the term we use for this space, and this space is indeed the third region of our kidney, that term we use for a space is of course a sinus. So here we have that sinus. It looks like my picture shifted on us slightly for this, but we get still the right idea. I wonder if I can grab that and move it. Yeah, well, cool, there we go. Excellent. Let's move that too. There, that makes me happy. All right, and I also want to get rid of my adrenal gland. All right, perfect, now I'm happy. Uh, this space basically connected to the hilum where things come in and out is known as the renal sinus. As we can see, uh, the fibrous capsule actually expands beyond this and into the sinus, separating it. So that same fibrous capsule that comes on the outside comes lines our renal sinus. The sinus then contains, like we said, adipose, like we talked about, blood vessels, like we talked about. But the other thing it connects, uh, pardon me, it contains, I should say, are these tubule structures 
that are responsible for collecting the urine, as we mentioned. When we talk about these calluses, and let's emphasize this here with an X, And of course it helps if I put it in the right place. Notice where I've put this X right here. This particular X, uh, if you think about it, receive this tubule right here is going to receive urine from this pyramid and this papillae only. So this small structure right here is what is known as a minor calyx. Calyx, of course, is the singular. Calyces, as we see here, is the plural. So notice they've done the same thing of showing this here. Here we see our, and again, let me highlight that, our minor calyx here. However, notice this one, and I will put a circle here for this one here. This particular calyx right here, this calyx could receive urine from this pyramid and from that pyramid. So notice this calyx can receive urine from two or more pyramids, in which case we would then call it a major. And that's really the key. When talking about the, callus, the calyx, the calyces, pardon me, a minor calyx receives urine from one pyramid only. Nope. Why is that not writing? Try that again. Minor calyx receives urine from one pyramid only, uh, whereas a major calyx, it's going to be two or more. And that's really the key. So when we're pointing at this on, uh, for instance, like an exam, minor, 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 major, major, major. Notice this one here, notice it's considered a minor calyx because what they're trying to represent for us is the three dimensionality of this. So notice uh, deep from away from us, deeper into the pyramid, more lateral, would be another pyramid sticking out. And so actually what we should see here would be the apex. But all of these would be our major calyces that would receive urine from two or more. Notice these major and minor calluses then feed urine into this funnel-shaped structure. And this funnel-shaped structure right here is what is known as the renal pelvis. So again, I'm gonna need to uh, clear this writing that I just did there so that then we can show how all of the calluses, minor and major, are gonna feed into this funnel-shaped structure. This funnel-shaped structure is known as the renal pelvis, and the renal pelvis is what carries the urine out of the kidney, and once it is out of the kidney, the renal pelvis is what feeds the kidney into the ureter. So the, the pelvis is the funnel that collects all the urine from the kidney and expresses it out of the kidney. And as it expresses it out into the kidney, it feeds it into the ureter. All right, so three main regions. We have our cortex and its columns that contain our nephrons. These are the functional units where we're gonna process the blood. Our pyramids contain massive numbers of tubules that are all basically parallel to each other, giving them a striped appearance. Uh, these pyramids are surrounded by cortex, forming our lobes. Uh, the papillae, the apexes of our pyramids, feed into our sinus, the space here at the center of our kidney. However, we don't want that urine just being released into nothing, so we need our tubules to collect those, and those are the minor calluses, which feed into the major calluses, which feed into the pelvis, which feed into the ureter. All right, any questions on that? All right, 
Excellent. We are not quite as far into the lecture as I would have liked to have been at this point, uh, but we spent a lot of important time at the beginning uh, talking about uh, the process of the class moving forward from here and the exam and things along those lines. So I'm okay with this. So this is a good uh, stopping point. We will go ahead. Uh, hold on. Can I explain again uh, when it's considered a filter? Ah, yeah, excellent. Uh, we will definitely, that is gonna be one of the huge points we are gonna emphasize moving forward, but here is the short version of this. Uh, starting here in the nephron is when we start to filter the blood. Uh, what I will tell you is during the course of a day, you produce over, um, oh, that's where I was writing it. You, produced, oh, you produce over 200 liters of filtrate. 200 liters of stuff is pulled out of your blood. Obviously, you don't have 200 liters of waste. Clearly, you're not producing 200 liters of urine, all right? because then we really would be giving this lecture during the bathroom. And you don't have 200 liters of extra stuff floating around inside your body that you would be able to get rid of during the course of the day anyway. So over 99% of that is processed and brought back into your body. So while 200 liters of stuff come out, forming what we call the filtrate, only about one to two liters of stuff is actually voided from your body. And that's what we call the urine. And the short answer to that process is, as we talked about actually right here, and let's emphasize it, where we put that X. When it is in the nephron, when it is in the tubules of the pyramid, uh, during that time, all of the uh, filtrate can be processed. We are constantly processing it when it is in the kidneys. However, when that is released into the, uh, when it is released into the, uh, after the apex, when it comes out of the apex into the uh, minor calyx, that is when it's considered urine. Once it's expressed from the papillae into the minor calyx, we are no longer processing it. And if we are no longer processing it, then it is now considered urine. So it is here, once it's expressed from the papillae, that we then consider it urine. All right, great question. Any others? All right, clearly we're not done with the anatomy. We have a lot more to talk about, but this is a good, like I said, natural stopping point. Uh, let's go ahead and take a break. Um, we'll call it a 10 minute break. Come back at uh, 9.25 and at 9.25, We will start up again, and let's remind myself to uh, start recorder. Excellent, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause it now. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, cancel that. Cancel that. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> Perfect. So I think everybody here can see that well. All right. There we go. All right. So any questions before we get back in? All righty. Oops. I guess we have to clear all of our drawings now. Uh, here we saw all of the illustrations of the basic anatomy, uh, gross anatomy of our kidney. And here is an actual kidney. If we get a chance to uh, come back to the class, maybe we'll hopefully get a chance to see that as well. All right, um, now, as we talked about, the hilum is going to be obviously where the uh, ureter comes out. Uh, it is also going to be where the nerves and blood vessels come in and out as well. Uh, the nerve supply to the uh, the nerve supply 
Sorry, I'm trying to do too many things at once, getting this all set up properly for me. That comes into the kidneys via the renal plexus, uh, where the autonomic nerve fibers and ganglia come in. As I'm sure you remember from 430, our kidneys um, do not receive dual innervation. Remember, one of the things we talked about uh, in 430 is that with uh, uh, most of the organs, uh, visceral organs, they receive dual innervation. They receive input from both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, that dual innervation gives us more fine uh, tuning control of it. But of course, the key word there is most, because most is not all. Uh, there are some others that just receive a uh, single innervation. Uh, we talked about how the adrenal gland just gets input from the sympathetic nervous system. The skin just gets input from the sympathetic nervous system. Most of our blood vessels just from the sympathetic and on and on and on. When we think of the two processing, our sympathetic nervous system is involved in um, our fight or flight stress responses and our parasympathetic is that storing of energy, the housekeeping type of activities. You would think that it would be parasympathetic that would be what is used to control the kidneys. Uh, but unintuitively, as it turns out, it is actually the sympathetic nervous system that primarily innervates the kidneys. We will talk about this control in much more detail uh, when we get into our both neural and hormonal control of the urinary system. But here's the short answer. As we've already talked about, uh, filtering your blood is a vitally important process. All right? So much so that we really don't need to tell the kidneys to do their job. They're going to do their job. In fact, while you're sitting here calmly in your you know, desk seat or couch seat or laying in bed or whatever it is that you're doing while you're listening to this, you're probably not super active unless you're on the treadmill while you're listening to this, in which case, awesome for you. But for those of you who are sitting or laying and listening to it, while you're sitting there calmly uh, listening to this, uh, about 25% of your blood is going to your kidneys every minute. So we don't necessarily need our parasympathetic nervous system to say, hey, while you're resting and digesting, make sure you're filtering the blood. However, if you were watching and listening this lecture on your treadmill, then you'd be much more physically active. And when you were much more physically active and using your sympathetic nervous system, 25% uh, of your blood's not going to your kidneys anymore. We are now distributing blood to other parts of your body, the heart, the lungs, the muscles, so that you can be active. When the blood volume to your, um, when the blood volume to your kidneys decreases, we don't want the efficiency of the kidneys to decrease as a result of that. So every time you step, get up to go take a walk, suddenly your kidneys don't function as well. So in those times when you're active, it is your sympathetic nervous system that is controlling your kidneys to maintain the efficiency of your kidneys even when uh, the blood volume decreases. So that's why it's sympathetic. And like I said, when we get to neural control, we will talk in much more precision of exactly how it is that that occurs. Again, uh, <clears throat> this comes off of uh, many uh, renal plexus and uh, off of the main celiac plexus, which is also the one that uh, is what controls respiration, where that phrenic nerve is located as well. Um, the other thing that our nerve supply does is regulates our renal blood flow. Right? And if we can train how much blood is going to there, like I said, we're going to influence how much we are filtering the blood and also influencing how much urine is being formed as well. Now, if you're going to be processing 25% of the blood every minute that goes through, then we need a massive and elaborate blood supply. There is a massive and elaborate blood supply to the kidneys, and we are going to need to understand the anatomy of that. Again, here's some facts that we've already mentioned, but we will state them again. While you're sitting here calmly listening to my lecture, 25% of your total blood volume is being processed by your kidneys each minute. As I also mentioned, during the course of the day, 200 liters of material is removed from your blood. Now again, those 200 liters that are removed are not the urine. That is fluid and components that need to be processed. 
and that fluid and components that need to be processed we call filtrate. So you produce 200 liters of filtrate during the course of the day and it is the kidney's responsibility to process and reabsorb over 99% of it. So that by the end of the day, while you produce 200 liters of filtrate, you only produce about one to two liters of urine. So it's a tremendous amount of work. Like I said, our kidneys are tremendous workhorses uh, doing all of this processing. To do this, not surprisingly, there is an incredibly elaborate blood vessel structure to the kidneys. Let me see what this next picture looks like. Yeah, I don't like that picture. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we are going to, uh, what do I want? Actually, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna draw it, or at least write it. Let's do that. So let's switch back to our whiteboard. We'll go through it with all the pretty pictures of your textbook and everything else that goes along with that. But let's start with something really simple and basic. We have our kidney. Right, and in that kidney, uh, let's draw um, some simple anatomy. Here is our sinus. Here is, and I'm just gonna draw a couple of these. There's one pyramid. There's another pyramid. Let's go ahead and give it a third, because I may need it. Excellent. Our pyramids, and then our cortex. So let's just put some quick letters here. So here is a C for our cortex. Here is an M for our medulla. Here is an S for our sinus. So we have those three regions. Now obviously the blood vessel that uh, <clears throat> because our circulation to our kidneys is part of the systemic circulation, of course it is going to come out of the uh, left ventricle into the ascending aorta, into the aortic arch, into the thoracic aorta, and let's start with the abdominal. aorta. From the abdominal aorta, we of course are going to feed into the renal arteries. And it is that renal artery, and let's go ahead and do that and use red. It is that renal artery that is going to go towards the kidney. However, notice the key word here is it goes towards the kidney. It does not actually enter the kidney before the renal artery. And again, let's go ahead and give some quick abbreviations. This is our renal artery. Before it um, enters the kidney, it branches. And as it branches, these branches form what we call these segmental arteries. And it is the segmental arteries that enter the hilum. If you think about it, this is somewhat similar to what we saw in the lungs. It is the uh, primary bronchi that went towards the lungs but then it branches into the secondary bronchi before it actually enters the lungs. So we're seeing something similar here. Uh, once we enter uh, the, into the sinus of the kidneys, our segmental arteries branch again, and as they branch again, they form blood vessels that go into the columns. Remember, these columns are what help to form the lobes. So notice this pyramid and the cortex around it, this pyramid and the cortex around it are the individual lobes. So notice this blood vessel is actually going between the lobes. And since this blood vessel is going between the lobes, that's how we actually identify it. The inter, oops, I spell it right? 
low bar artery. So again, it goes between the lobes, as the name would indicate. Once it goes between the lobes, then our blood vessel is going to branch again. When it branches again, basically what it does is it goes over the base of our pyramids. Remember, this is a pyramid. So up here, we have the apex. And down here, we have the base of our pyramid. And so what we have is this blood vessel that basically goes on the border, the boundary between uh, the pyramid and the cortex. Notice it kind of arcs over the base on that boundary. And so that blood vessel that arcs over the base, we call the arcuate. Oops. Artery. So the arcuate artery basically, um, arcs over the border, or is found on the border of the medulla and the cortex. Excellent. Once there, what we need are arteries that are going to penetrate deep into the cortex. These uh, separate them into the functional areas where our magical spe special structure and that magical special structure, and let's go ahead and emphasize this here, in here is going to be, and I'm going to put a big, actually let's do this because I'm going to totally cheat and make it easier for me because I like it when life is easy over here. And we'll put a big N in here to remember, oops, that this is our nephron. So again, remember, our kidney has over 1 million of these structures called the nephrons. They are going to be the functional and structural units. And so ultimately, our goal is to get the blood to all of these nephrons. To do that, we have these blood vessels that are radiating off of the arcuate artery into the cortex, and that is where they get their name. They are the cortical radiate artery. Oh no, we want that to be red. Excellent. These cortical radiant arteries, uh, because it compartmentalizes the nephrons, would sometimes be referred to, and you may see this, I don't believe our textbook uses the term anymore, but our atlas used to, and so you may see this in some of the other places as you're looking around. They're the interlobular, because our lobes are divided into lobules. We've seen that before. So sometimes they're referred to as the interlobular artery. But not surprisingly, interlobar and interlobular can sometimes be confusing. Uh, so uh, now cortical radiate artery is the uh, more commonly used term. Then we, of course, need to get blood from that cortical radiant artery into the nephron. So we actually have a blood vessel that feeds that blood into the nephron. And the blood vessel that feeds into the nephron is, uh, again, uh, and not surprisingly, if the nephron is where we're going to process the blood, there are going to be capillaries in there. And of course, uh, if there are capillaries in there, then what we need is something that is going to uh, feed blood into the capillaries. So we have an afferent arteriole. And that afferent arteriole feeds in 
to that magical structure that we call the nephron. Um, let's do it. This way. There we go. Uh, so we need to move that down, bring this over here, and then I'm going to cheat on all this stuff. Move this over here. Where's the rest of that? There we go. Excellent. So now if I move all this up down, we can follow the blood vessels on their path from the abdominal aorta into that special, mystical, magical structure we call the nephron. Nephron is where the magic happens. And again, we're going to spend a whole week talking about all the magic that goes on inside of that nephron. As I mentioned, that nephron contains capillaries. In fact, it is not just one, but there are actually two very specific capillaries that it has inside of it. Uh, but while we'll talk about the nephron in a minute, what I want to do first is once we are then done processing the blood in the nephron, that blood then needs to leave the nephron. And as it leaves the nephron, uh, the first thing that blood feeds into is into a venule. All right, after all, capillaries are fed in by arterioles, feed out into venules, that makes sense. Then our blood, not surprisingly, follows a path out of the kidney, very similar to the path it followed in. There are going to be veins that drain the capillary, and these veins, I mean the cortex, that drain the cortex, and not surprisingly, these are the cortical gradient veins, Oops. or what are also known as interlobular veins. Right. They feed into a vein that arches over the base of the pyramid, basically on the border of the medulla and the cortex. And not surprisingly, uh, we call that the arcuate vein. Again, it's on the border of the medulla and cortex. And I see now that I misspelled medulla on the previous one. That's fine. You get the idea. Those arcuate veins are then going to feed into veins that go through the columns between the lobes. So again, not surprisingly, they are known as the interlobar because they go between the lobes, veins. Again, between the lobes. And of course, guess where it goes from there? That's right, the obvious guess would be into segmental veins, but if we've learned nothing, it's that we know anatomists hate us. So as it turns out, there are no segmental arteries. All the arteries that are coming out, all those interlobar uh, arteries that come out between the lobes, all come together, and when they come together, they form, oops, the renal, vein and of course the renal vein I have to cheat and do it this way as we know feeds into the inferior vena 
Keva. So notice there is no segmental veins, but other than that, there is complete symmetry in the arterial and the venous structure of the kidney. So what we have here is this great symmetry. We'll come back and fill in the blood vessel structures of our uh, nephron in just a minute, but what I'd like to do is now go back to the slide presentation. In the slide presentation, uh, we can see everything that I've just drawn uh, in nice, pretty pictures. So notice here we have the arterial structure as we've talked about. Here is that renal artery. And let's actually, where's my annotation? There we are. Use my highlighter. Uh, we have our renal artery uh, that again goes towards the kidney, but then before it actually enters the kidney splits, and again, a nose looks, um, looks like it's actually coming in. It should actually split a little closer out here. Again, a little artistic license. Uh, but it splits into the segmental arteries. Segmental arteries are what pass through the sinus region, right, the hollow space at the center of there. And then it branches to form the blood vessels that go between the pyramids into the columns. So here we have the interlobar arteries. Those interlobar arteries then feed into the arcuate arteries that arc over the base of the pyramid. And from there, they branch into the cortical radiant arteries, which radiate into the cortex. Heck, all of these things are in the name. This arcs over the base, this goes between the lobes, right? These arc into the, uh, pardon me, radiate into the uh, cortex. And from there, we need to enter into that nephron. In that nephron, there are, uh, like I said, not one, but two special capillaries. So we'll cheat here and see some of the structures of that. But again, we'll talk about this in, in more detail in just a second. So we'll come back and add these in here. Uh, but it is then going to feed out into our venules. Our venules feed out of the nephron. And then we have our symmetry, our cortical radiant veins into the arcuate veins. Those arcuate veins feed into the interlobar veins. But notice, even though they merge together, these are not called segmental veins for whatever reason. Why? I don't have a good reason other than, again, as we've always talked about in Adam Satio. Uh, from there, they then, uh, those interlobar veins then fuse together to form the renal vein. And then, of course, the renal vein is going to go to the inferior vena cava, bringing the blood back to the heart. All right. Questions on that? Alrighty, then let us then go back to our picture to talk a little bit more about what's going on in the nephron because we need to elaborate on this just a little bit and then we're actually going to go into great detail about the nephron. Uh, but let us start first by going back to the whiteboard and finish in those last few things. As I mentioned, one of the things that is special about our nephron is that it has not one but two Capillaries. It's a little harder for me to be subtle when I'm typing these things instead of writing them like I normally would be. It's actually kind of two and a half, or we could even think of it maybe as a third, but we'll explain what that is in a minute. Our afferent arterioles job is to feed into the first capillary. The first capillary is a highly specialized capillary known as the glomerulus. Uh, for those of you who had me for 430, uh, that term glomerulus may seem mildly familiar because way back in the very beginning of 430 when we were doing tissues, the very first tissue we looked at was a simple squamous epithelial tissue. Hold on a second, I need a drink. And where we looked at it was in the kidney. In the kidney, we find a specialized structure that was known as the renal corpuscle, where we had a capsule that was made up of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. And we talked about how it wrapped around a very special capillary.
and that special capillary is known as the glomerulus. That glomerulus uh, is job is to start the filtering process. We're going to talk a lot about that glomerulus and what it is that it does, but it is uh, the specialized capillary, very, very different from pretty much every other capillary that we've talked about in this class. And it starts the processing of the blood. There is then a second capillary. That second capillary is known as the paratubular. And this is more of a uh, traditional capillary in its function. So we will talk about that. And it is that that feeds out of the venule into, I mean, pardon me, out of the nephron into the venule. Myself a little bit of extra room. So let's do that. That. And that. What we need then is a structure that is going to connect the two. We got to be able to bring the two together. One capillary, as it turns out, can't feed into another capillary. And as we know, all capillaries need to be fed into by an arteriole. So what happens is one of the things that makes the glomerulus special is that not only is it fed into by an arteriole, but it feeds out into an arteriole. And if it's the afferent arteriole that feeds into it, it should not be surprising that it is the efferent arteriole that feeds out of it. Notice the efferent arteriole is considered a part of the nephron, whereas the afferent arteriole is not. So the afferent arteriole is not considered part of the nephron, the efferent arteriole is. Now, as I mentioned, our nephron can have two and a half capillaries. That's because while there is this paratubular capillary that the efferent arteriole feeds into, in some instances, the afferent arteriole will also or can also feed into another specialized capillary known as the vasa recta. As we'll see, not always, not every, not every nephron is going to have a vasa recta but some of them will have a vasa recta, and so those that do have a vasa recta will need to be fed into as well. So this vasa recta is not always present in the nephron, that's why we call it two and a half, but every nephron has a glomerulus, every nephron has a paratubular capillary. And so we have the path of the blood entering into the nephron, it gets processed by these blood vessels in the nephron, and the tubules of the nephron, and then it leaves out the venules. So here we complete our path. Again, like the textbook shows, and we'll go back to it as we just saw, uh, there is the glomerulus, the efferent arteriole, and the paratubular capillary. Uh, your book doesn't show the vasa recta on that simple illustration, but I wanted to make sure we mentioned it here. So let's now go back to the lecture. And here we see, lo and behold, I keep losing my annotation. There we go. Afferent arteriole feeds into the glomerulus. Glomerulus feeds into the efferent arteriole, which feeds into the paratubular capillaries or the vasa recta. Uh, we could cheat and put the vasa recta here as well. And then it feeds out the venules and the path back. So that absolutely is our blood flow. Again, being the sophisticated students that you are, appreciate and know that there will almost certainly be a picture like this on the lab exam. We'll all have arrows pointing at all these different blood vessels and asking you to identify them. That is definitely something you'll be responsible for. But again, also this could easily be an essay question as well. I could ask you to identify and describe the path the blood would take from the, uh, heck, it could even go from the left ventricle of the heart till it comes back to the right atrium of the heart and give the path that it would take to go through the kidney and identify all the blood vessels on the way. And of course, you should be able to get to the renal artery, uh, ascending aorta, aortic arch, 
thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta, which then feeds into the renal artery. And of course, the renal vein feeds into the inferior vena cava, which feeds right back into the right atrium. So that should easily be an easy essay question that you should be able to identify. All right, questions on the blood flow through our kidney. All righty then, excellent. Then it's time to talk about our nephron. As I mentioned, the nephron is the structural and the functional unit of the kidneys. As I said, each kidney has over a million of them. Uh, so these are massively important structures that are responsible. Like I said, the, 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 the workload that they have of uh, processing 200 liters of uh, filtrate during the course of the day is incredibly massive and impressive. If you were to pull all the nephrons out, as tiny as these things are, if you think about the fact that you have a million of them uh, inside of your kidney, if you were to pull them all out and string them out end to end, it would hurt a lot. And obviously it is the nephrons that are responsible for forming our urine. It is the urinary system after all. But as we talked about, the goal isn't to make urine. You don't survive because you make urine. You survive because we filter the blood. So really what we're thinking of is that it's filtering the blood. And as it filters the blood, then the result of that is that we get urine from the filtering of the blood. All right, so really this is our job. Remove the wastes and regulate the conditions of the blood. This is what is important. Now, as we already hinted at and we've already seen the fancy names of, our nephron is comprised of two components. Those two components are the blood vessels and the renal tubules. And so when we talk about the anatomy of our nephron, there are two big components of it uh, that we need to be able to talk about. All right, here's the pretty picture. How do I want to do this? Uh, you know what, I think what will help is if we go through that first and list it and talk about this. I would like to have this picture available, but I think the best thing for us to do is to actually talk about it first and then we'll come back. Actually, I guess we can do both. Let's do this. Let's see if I can sneak this stuff in here. When we look at the nephron, as again, one of the important things to remember, and I'll write it up here so that we don't forget, it is comprised of tubules and blood vessels. All right, so there are two components of it. We've already identified and listed the blood vessels, and we can do that again over here on this side. We will talk more about them. I don't know why I keep capitalizing my own blood vessels, because I'm a horrible typist, that's why. Um, and those blood vessels, of course, as we mentioned, are the glomerulus, Uh, the efferent arteriole, arterial. uh, that doesn't look right, there we go, paratubular capillary, and uh, also our vasorecta. Excellent, and we'll come back and I promise we'll talk about those in detail. But what I wanna do first is to identify the tubular components, because we haven't even mentioned the names of these things yet. That make them up. And conveniently enough, there are, if we think of the facet recta, four blood vessel structures, and conveniently enough, there are four tubular structures. The force, first tubular structure is what is known as Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule, of course, is called Bowman's capsule because good old Bob Bowman was the first person who described it and illustrated it and put, published it in a uh, book. But the other thing Bowman's capsule can be called, and it is perfectly acceptable to do this, is to call it the glomerular capsule. And it's called the glomerular capsule because as we see here in our illustration, it surrounds 
the glomerulus. The glomerulus, as we talked about, is that specialized capillary. It is where our 200 liters of filtrate are going to come out, right? If we think about this, we have this capillary, this big, huge, special capillary where 200 liters of stuff is going to come out of it. And if 200 liters of stuff is going to come out of it, then basically what we need is a cup to catch that stuff that comes out. And that's what Bowman's capsule is. Bowman's capsule is basically the cup that collects the filtrate as the filtrate comes out. So we have the blood that is coming out. Wow, those arrows are huge. We have the blood that is coming out, or filtrate at this point that is coming out, and we now need a cup to catch that filtrate. Now, if we have a million of these nephrons, we need to be able to make these things as small as possible. So not surprisingly, our Bowman's capsule is comprised of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. It is just a single layer of flat cells that we can see. However, there is something interesting about it. Uh, and that is that this Bowman's capsule is really just the parietal layer. Oops. Parietal layer of cells. Right, this simple squamous epithelia here is a parietal layer of cells. As it turns out, and let me do my drawing here and slightly change the color to emphasize this. Bowman's capsule actually expands out to wrap around the capillaries of the glomerulus. These, let me, no, I'm gonna need to uh, see if that does it. This particular layer here, oops, wrong direction. Do that. This particular layer here that is attaching to it, and so that didn't do what I wanted it to do, are made up of special cells, and those special cells are known as podocytes. So we also have a visceral layer. This visceral layer is made up of very specialized cells called podocytes. And these podocytes wrap around and help to stabilize the glomerulus. So when we talk about Bowman's capsule, what we're really talking about here is this parietal layer of cells that form the cup. In fact, this whole structure has a name. This whole structure right here, from there, there we go. This whole structure has a name, and that name is the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is basically comprised of three components. The first of those components is the glomerulus. The second is the parietal layer. of Bowman's capsule, the simple squamous epithelial tissue. And the third component is the space in between. After all, if our job is to have a cup where we can collect things, then we need that space. And that space is known as Bowman's space. So those three components, one, two, and three, form what we call our renal corpuscle. Our renal corpuscle is a highly specialized structure. This is where we start the process of making filtrate, start the process of filtering our urine. And one of the special things about this renal corpuscle is this renal corpuscle is found in one place and one place only in the body. The only place you'll find this renal corpuscle is in the cortex of the kidney. 
So if you see a renal corpuscle, you know that not only are you in the kidney, but you know that you are in the cortex of the kidney. So it is a very specialized, very important structure that we can uh, easily use to identify where we're located in the body because this thing is found in one place and one place only in the kidneys. So this parietal layer of Bowman's capsule is known as the, um, is part of the renal corpuscle and it is comprised of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. And its job is basically to be the cup that collects the filtrate. All right, so that is part one of our renal tubule, that is Bowman's capsule. Notice from there, we then have all these tubules that are gonna be involved in processing the filtrate. Right here, uh, once again, this reaches and receives 200 liters of filtrate, and then we need to process and bring most of it back. And that is the responsibility of these tubules, the remaining renal tubules. Notice these renal tubules basically have a couple distinct characteristics about them. The first part of it is all twisty and turny, and it is closest to the renal corpuscle. So this part here, our second tubule is known as the proximal convoluted proximal because it is closest there I did it again Oops. not a good typist to begin with but when I try to talk and type at the same time it's not pretty proximal convoluted tubule this is where a majority of the processing takes place most of the processing of the filtrate is going to take place here in the proximal convoluted tubule. From there though, notice our tubule straightens out where we have a big long linear component and there in a hairpin turn and another big long linear component. Notice something else that's going on here. Remember our renal corpuscle is only found in the cortex of our kidney. But lo and behold, these are the arcuate arteries and veins, meaning this here is the boundary between the cortex and the medulla. So notice not only does our tubule straighten out, but it straightens out and forms this big, huge hairpin turn that can actually penetrate deep into the medulla of our kidney. This component here is what is known as the loop of Henle. And as you can see, the loop of Henle has two parts. It has the uh, descending limb, and the ascending limb. And I need that back there. Excellent. Notice after it comes up the ascending limb, it goes back into another twisty and turny convoluted tubule. However, this convoluted, convoluted tubule is further from the uh, renal corpuscle. And because it's further from the renal corpuscle, it is known as the distal. Oops. Diluted tubule. And that is the last component of our nephron. So we have four components. Bowman's capsule, which is the parietal layer to be specific, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule. We need to talk a little bit more about the anatomy of these the same way we did with Bowman's capsule. But before we do that, and for this I'm gonna to need to erase this amazing drawing that I've done of the renal corpuscle. So I have some more playroom. Notice that the distal convoluted tubule feeds the filtrate into another tubular structure. This other tubular structure right here is what is known as the collecting duct. The collecting duct is not a part of the nephron. All right. 
its job is to collect the filtrate from the nephrons. However, it is still capable oops, of processing the fil fluid, the filtrate. So just because the fluid is in the collecting duct, it is not considered urine yet because it is still capable of being processed. So it is out of the nephron, but it can still be fine tuned by the collecting duct. However, it is the collecting duct that then expresses the filtrate out of the papillae at the end of our pyramids. And so once the fluid leaves the collecting duct, is expressed out of the papillae, and of course that would be into a calyx. Then once it's expressed out of the papillae into the calyx, then it is going to finally be urine and we are finally done processing it. So this collecting duct, important things are happening in the collecting duct. We are still processing in the collecting duct, but the collecting duct is not considered part of the nephron. The nephron is, slow, is solely made out of these regions, Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. So those are the important structures there. All right. Now, as I mentioned, we need to come back. We talked about the anatomy of Bowman's capsule in detail. We need to talk a little bit about the, uh, the rest of the renal tubules. For that, I am going to have to uh, remove this, so let's give this a second. Um, well, let's talk about these two things first. Proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. Both the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule is where a large amount of processing is going to take place. However, as I mentioned, in the proximal convoluted tubule is where the majority of the processing occurs. Because of that, if we were to look at the anatomy of the proximal convoluted tubule, there are going to be some specializations to it. It is going to have, and I've totally run out of spaces to do these things, so let's get rid of this now. Uh, just so I can briefly write it over here. In our proximal convoluted tubule, uh, we have more extensive uh, microvilli. Remember, microvilli are uh, non-motile finger-like extensions of the cells. And as such, they're not moving the substance inside of them, but they are dramatically increasing the surface area. So by having extensive microvilli uh, in these, oh, and actually we should go back a second. These are going to be simple cuboidal uh, epithelial tissue cells. They're gonna have a more extensive microvilli, bigger surface area for more processing uh, to take place. But unlike the respiratory system here, a large amount of the processing is active. So the other thing that we're gonna see in these cells is they have a massive, a number of mitochondria. Okay. Our distal convoluted tubule is really where our fine tuning is going to take place. So in our distal convoluted tubule, it is also a simple a squamous epithelial tissue. But here, it has fewer and less extensive microvilli. And it's going to have fewer mitochondria. Right, because here in our distal convoluted tubule is more where we're doing the fine tuning. Well, then the question becomes, what's happening here in our loop of Henle? If we're processing up here in the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule, what is the loop of Henle? And loop of Henle's main job is to play a role in both the osmolarity 
of the um, filtrate and also the concentration. Hopefully you're all staying properly hydrated. And if you're properly hydrated, you typically produce a large volume of very dilute urine. However, if you become dehydrated, then typically the volume of urine you produce uh, decreases and it typically becomes more concentrated. So for instance, it's a smaller volume, but a much darker yellow coloration because it becomes more concentrated and it becomes a smaller volume. That difference you've seen between dilute urine and concentrated urine has to do with the conditions of your body. And it is here in the loop of Henle where we have more control over that osmolarity and the concentration of volume. Again, osmolarity obviously is concentration of solutes. So concentration of the volume, let's make sure we emphasize that as well. And I guess I have to extend that out to make that point the volume of urine that is going to be produced as well. To do that, as you can see here from our illustrations, there is differences in the anatomy between the descending limb and the ascending limb. The descending limb is actually what is also known as the thin limb. So our descending limb more specifically is the thin descending limb whereas the ascending limb is thick. And the reason for that, and let's go back and I can do this here, the descending limb is thin because it is comprised of simple squamous epithelial tissues, whereas the thick ascending limb is simple cuboidal. In fact, it is more similar to the distal uh, convoluted tubule than it actually is if I do that there, then that actually lines up. Perfect. Our thin limb is a simple squamous. Our thick limb is a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. And so not only are they different anatomically, but not surprisingly, then they're going to be different functionally as well. And so it's going to be here in the thin limb where we're going to be able to control the osmolarity and we're going to be able to cause the affect the concentration or volume of our uh, ultimate urine that we are producing. All right, so we have these differences in the anatomy and even the distal convoluted tubule, which I mentioned is not a part of the nephron, but does process. And because it's processing, this uh, collecting duct also is going to be comprised of simple uh, cuboidal, epithelial tissues. And there's actually primarily two types of cells uh, that form our collecting duct. And those are, as we'll see, the intercalate and the chief cells. And we'll see those in a minute when I look at the pretty pictures from this. So these are the tubular components of the nephron. Again, there are four of them. The four parts of them are one here, our uh, uh, Bowman's capsule, prior to layer of Bowman's capsule, two, the um, proximal convoluted tubule, three, the loop of Henle comprised of the thin descending limb and the thick ascending limb, and four, our distal convoluted tubule. Those are the four tubular components of our nephron and they are associated with this collecting duct, which again, not a part of the nephron, but does still process the filtrate as we are expressing it ultimately then out of the... Why does it keep happening? All right, out of the... Um, I have to let my wife get that. Out of the uh, nephron and then ultimately out of the kidney where it then becomes urine. Now, as I mentioned, I've seen the, uh, described the anatomy of this, but what I like about this picture from your textbook, and then so for this, I now need to um, delete this stuff that I've put over here, because as we do that, then we can see uh, the pretty pictures from your textbook that talks about and emphasizes these things. So I need to move these things over here. And notice then now as we look through the pretty pictures, here we see uh, the illustration of those simple squamous 
cells that are making the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule, forming the cup that is part of that renal corpuscle. Here we have that specialized podocyte that is that visceral layer of Bowman's capsule sitting on top of the glomerulus. It is a special cell called a podocyte that are found there. Here we see what our proximal convoluted tubule cells look like. Again, they're simple cuboidal cells with extensive microvilli for increased surface area and extensive mitochondria. Here we have that thin descending limb of the loop of Henle which feeds into the thick ascending, which basically, as we mentioned, looks the same as our distal convoluted tubule. Notice both of these are gonna be cuboidal cells with fewer microvilli and fewer mitochondria in them. And then, as I mentioned, it is going to then feed into our collecting duct, uh, which has those principal cells and the intercalated cells, the two different types of cells in it, where we can still process. All righty, so questions on the anatomy of these uh, cells. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. So just to be clear, um, starting at the, the proximal convoluted tubule, it has simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, and then the descending limb has simple squamous, and then the ascending limb has simple cuboidal, and then the distal convoluted tubule has simple squamous? No, distal convoluted tubule is also simple cuboidal, as is the collecting duct. So basically, we only have two tissue types here, simple squamous and simple cuboidal. The parietal layer of Bowman's capsule is simple squamous. The thin descending limb of the loop of Henle is simple squamous. Everything else is simple cuboidal. However, notice there are some differences. The simple cuboidal in the proximal convoluted tubule have more microvilli and more mitochondria, whereas those in the thick uh, uh, ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubule have fewer mitochondria and fewer uh, microvilli to them. And then the uh, collecting duct actually has two different types of cuboidal cells. Now we can actually see this histologically. This is one of the things that we wanted to talk about and so this is actually an opportunity uh, where we can actually, this is a great lead into this. Let's go and take a look and a reminder. Where is it? Here. Remember in your um, study area, right? If we go into our study area and actually I will save us some time and do that. No, that's not what I want. That's what I want. Uh, under your study tools in your study area is a, a link to that uh, virtual anatomy lab that is here on uh, Cosumnes River College's site. And if we go down to the urinary system, we have uh, the models and charts, which we'll take a look at a little bit. Uh, actually, we'll take a look at in just a minute here. But the other thing we have here is some great histology. Let's actually go to the histology first. Perfect. Excellent. Notice what we see here is that specialized structure that should be a dead giveaway that when you see this, you know exactly where you are in the body. This is, we are in the cortex of the kidney. And we know that because we see this specialized structure here that is a renal corpuscle. This renal corpuscle, as we mentioned, is comprised of three components. The first of those components is this structure right here, and that is the, glomer the glomerulus. This big, huge glob that we see here is our specialized capillary that is known as the glomerulus. And in fact, most of the nuclei that you see are actually those podocytes sitting on top. Now, we'll need an electron microscope to see those podocytes more clearly. And uh, hopefully your, uh, I haven't actually looked at the histology on here to see if they have an electron microscopy view. But if not, your textbook definitely has them. I show you some examples of them. And our models do a great job of showing this as well. However, the other thing we see right here is the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. And we can clearly see it is made up of a single layer of flat cells. 
Like most simple squamous cells, the cells are so flat that the nucleus kind of bulges out. So there is the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. Notice it's surrounded by all these tubules, and all these tubules are comprised of simple cuboidal cells. So here are simple cuboidal cells forming a tubule. Here are simple cuboidal cells forming a tubule. And again, they're all twisty and turny, so how are we gonna know which is which? Can we actually distinguish the proximal convoluted tubule from the distal convoluted tubule histologically? The answer, it turns out, is yes. The easiest way to do that is to look in the lumen. Remember what we talked about, the proximal convoluted tubule is where the majority of the processing is gonna take place. And one of the ways we see that is by having large microvilli. Notice as we look at the lumen of this structure right here, or the lumen of this structure right here, or the lumen of this structure right here, it's not clear. It's kind of fuzzy and dirty looking. The reason for that are those extensive microvilli. So this structure here, this structure here, this structure here, all of these are examples of proximal convoluted tubules. But look at this one here. Notice this one here, the lumen is very clear. Over here, the lumen is very clear. Right here, the lumen is very clear. These with a much more clear lumen are gonna be the examples of the distal convoluted tubule. That clear lumen shows us it has much fewer microvilli. The microvilli are much less extensive. And so the lumen of these structures are gonna be more clear. So notice the distal and proximal convoluted tubules are both simple cuboidal. It's not the shape or the structure of the cells that are forming the tubes that are going to allow us to tell them apart. It's actually going to be the uh, internal anatomy of them. If we can see a uh, cloudy lumen, we know it is a proximal convoluted tubule because of all the microvilli. If we see a clear lumen, then we know it's the distal convoluted tubule. Now, of course, we can't see the mitochondria inside, but we do know this one has more mitochondria. This one we know has less mitochondria. All right, okay, now, thank you. yep, great question. Notice the other place we will see this as well. Uh, and let's go through, here's the chart. We'll come to all of these things. We'll talk about all of these things. But here, these are the things that are in the classroom, which I absolutely love. In our classroom, we have these plaques that have three models on them. Here is our first model, and it is the gross anatomy. Notice in the gross anatomy, we can clearly see the cortex and the pyramids and the columns and the blood vessels and the sinus and the calluses and all the fun anatomy there. And again, notice they've done a really nice job of showing us all the anatomy there. They actually show it to us a second time where they emphasize the blood vessels uh, that we can see here. So notice we see all of that really nicely. However, on the plaque next to it, we also have these more microscopic views. Notice what we can see here is we are looking inside of one pyramid and some of the cortex that surrounds it. Notice again, those arcuate arteries and veins are located at the border between the medulla and the cortex. And notice here, we can see those cortical uh, radiant arteries that would feed into an afferent arteriole that would then feed into a nephron. So we see a couple examples of nephrons. Notice here we see all the renal corpuscles, right? We know this is Bowman's capsule, and even though we can't see it, we know inside is gonna be that glomerulus because they've opened a couple of them up for us. And then notice here we have that glomerulus feeding into Bowman's capsule, into the proximal convoluted tubule, into our loop of Henle. Notice some loop of Henleys are short, only go a little bit into the medulla, or some actually won't go into the medulla at all. But some of these loops of Henle go deep, 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 can go almost to the very bottom of our medulla and come back up. When they come back up, they come to the twisty, turny part that is the distal convoluted tubule. And then, of course, they leave the nephron into our collecting duct, which takes the uh, filtrate and expresses it out the pyramid to form our urine. So here we can see uh, the uh, tubular anatomy that we just talked about, Bowman's capsule. Here we see the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule. So we can see all of that. And then right next to this structure is an up close and personal 
look at our renal corpuscle. Notice here we have the simple squamous epithelial tissue, which is the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. Here we have the glomerulus inside that specialized capillary. And here they've shown us so we can actually see the capillary. But notice on this side, what they've done is they've shown for us those special podocytes. Remember the podocytes are the specialized cells, the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule that is here wrapping around and supporting uh, the uh, glomerulus, the capillary. They're called podocytes because they have these big foot-like processes. And we'll see what they look like on a uh, electron microscopy view in just a minute but we get a, a, a sense of those foot-like processes from those that surround those. So again, we have the space in here, which is Bowman space, the glomerulus, and the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. So here we have a renal corpuscle. Notice it's being fed into by the afferent arteriole, fed out of by the efferent arteriole, and we'll go to the paratubular capillaries. But notice also, our Bowman's capsule feeds into our proximal convoluted tubule. So while it collects the filtrate, it feeds it into our proximal convoluted tubule. And notice, they've kind of tried to emphasize that they're making it all fuzzy looking to show all of the extensive microvilli that would be on this as it carries that filtrate and processes it. So notice we can see these things both histologically on actual histology slides and identify them, but we can also see them here on these great models that we have as well. So here we are seeing in illustrations, in models, in an actual uh, microscope slides, we are able to actually see the anatomy of all of these tubules. All right, questions on that? All right, so again, here we see uh, all of that anatomy of the tubule components of our nephron. However, as we mentioned, we also have our blood supply that we need to talk about. And again, we've already identified uh, the four structures that are gonna be part of the nephron's blood supply. They are, again, first the glomerulus, uh, secondly, they are going to be the efferent arteriole. arteriole. Again, the job of the efferent arteriole is to take the blood from the glomerulus and feed it to the paratubular capillaries. And that is our third component. our paratubular capillaries. Uh, and again, we'll kind of put it as a 3B. We have the vasa recta. Oops. We have the vasa recta. Now, as I talked about, and again, I'll do it here with the pretty words, and then we'll take a look at it with the pretty pictures. The glomerulus is a highly specialized capillary. Uh, some of the ways that it is highly specialized, it is it is high pressure. Right? If you remember back to when we talked about the cardiovascular system, uh, one of the parts that were more challenging to most people, but we talked about the capillary exchange. And if you remember when that capillary exchange take, took place, the primary factor that determined which way things moved in the capillary was uh, the blood pressure. If you remember at the arterial end of the capillary, the blood pressure was 35 millimeters of mercury. And when you got to the venous end, it was 70, uh, 17 millimeters. I'm sorry, so yeah, so 35 to 17. We saw that difference in them there. All right. Um, so those are the differences in pressure. The glomerular pressure is much more higher. It is actually closer to 55 uh, millimeters 
of mercury, much, much higher than we see in a typical capillary. All right. One of the ways that we think, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. The glomerulus is special because it is fed into and out of by an arteriole. So again, most art capillaries feed out of the uh, out of them into a venule. Venules are veins; they're lower pressure. Arteries are higher pressure, so it has a high pressure blood vessel coming into it, a high pressure blood vessel going out of it. So it is high pressure that way. The other big difference between the capillaries is remember when we looked at a typical systemic capillary or the respiratory capillaries that we looked at, uh, there was the two-way movement of material. Things moved both into the capillary and out of the capillary. In a systemic capillary, typically they moved out at the arterial end and back in at the venous end. However, in the glomerulus, the glomerulus is a one-way capillary. Things only move out. Right? And in fact, this is where we make our filtrate. So the 200 liters of stuff that filter out, filter out of our glomerulus. This is where we make our filtrate. It's only a one-way capillary, it only comes out. And let's actually put that back up onto that line, which gives me room to say one more thing. The other big way that our glomerulus is specialized is it is a fenestrated capillary. If you remember uh, when we talked about most systemic capillaries are continuous, where it has a completely intact epithelial tissue to it, simple squamous endothelium, uh, that is our capillary, and that's what we saw, for instance, the respiratory system. But remember back in the cardiovascular system when we talked about blood vessels, we talked about how uh, some of the capillaries uh, can have fenestrations, additional pores in them. And those larger pores, basically, as the name indicates, makes them more porous, makes it easier for things to come out. So by having a fenestrated capillary, there is more space for larger things to be able to get out. So it is a fenestrated capillary, and this is where we make our filtering. Efferent arteriole is just a conduit, like all arteries, carrying blood from one location to another. And it brings it to our paratubular capillaries. Our paratubular capillaries are more typical capillaries. Uh, again, one of the ways it's typical is there's two-way movement of stuff. Right? And again, if we think of the two-way movement of stuff, if you think about it, things that come out of the capillary are going into the filtrate and potentially leaving the body. So it's kind of outward. So that would be what we would think of as secretion. <clears throat> Whereas also uh, things that are brought back into the capillary are going to stay in the body or more specifically be brought back into the body. So things that are brought out of the filtrate back into the capillaries are being brought back into the body. So we basically call that reabsorption. So we have two-way movement out of the capillary and in, reabsorption, bringing it back in, or secretion, which is kicking it out. Uh, paratubular capillaries are low pressure, more of a typical, right, 35 at one end, uh, 17 at the other end type of pressure to those paratubular capillaries. And as the name would indicate, paratubular, they are basically wrapped around the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. All right, and around our small loops of Henle. But remember, some of our loops of Henle, we said could be really large. In the really long loops of Henle, we are going to have a very specialized drape-like capillary that is going to wrap around them. And that drape-like ca capillary that wraps around them and plays an important role in regulating that osmolarity 
is going to be the vasa recta. So only the nephrons that have really long loops of Henle can also have a vasa recta, or will, I should say, have a vasa recta wrapped around them. All right. All right, I've written this out, but, uh, and hopefully uh, that makes some semblance of sense. But as often, I think the best way to see this is actually look at the pretty pictures of this. So I think I'm gonna have to get rid of this. So I'll leave this here one more second uh, so you guys can see that or finish writing it down if you need to. Uh, but let's go ahead and get rid of that now so that we can actually take a look at the pretty pictures of all of these things. So we can go ahead and uh, erase this now or just clear that. Bingo. And then we can take a look at the pretty pictures. So like I said, uh, three capillary beds and that efferent uh, arteriole are what comprise the nephron. The first is the glomerulus. Here is that histology again, that beautiful, beautiful histology. Here we can see uh, that glomerulus. Again, here we see the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule wrapping around it and the space in between that Bowman space where we're gonna collect the filtrate. So here's our glomerulus where we are going to make uh, that, we're gonna make that filtrate. That is what takes place here, right? Again, it is a highly specialized capillary, high pressure, fed into by an arteriole, fed out of by an arteriole, fenestrated in its anatomy, and it has those special podocytes that wrap around it. In fact, if we go back to the model that we were looking at, why didn't that work? There we go. Again, here we see the same thing here. Here is that glomerulus. Notice uh, this one, they kind of show us the fenestrations. I think that's what these dots are supposed to represent. They're not the nuclei. They're supposed to represent the fenestrations, the holes in this capillary. Here we see the podocytes sitting on top of it. And again, it is fed into by the afferent arteriole, feeds out of by the efferent arteriole, and it is surrounded by Bowman's capsule. And then of course, the space where we're gonna collect that filtrate is Bowman's space. Here, we see some nice examples of a paratubular capillary. Notice this paratubular capillary is wrapped around the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. Notice it is being fed into, hold on, I gotta grab this and move it out of my way. Come on, there we go. Uh, notice it is the efferent, and here, let me highlight this. Afferent arteriole feeds into the glomerulus, efferent arteriole feeds out, and that efferent arteriole that feeds out feeds into the paratubular capillaries. These paratubular capillaries wrap around the tubules, as their name would indicate. These are typical capillaries, two-way movements of materials into and out of the blood supply. So things coming out of the blood into the tubules would be secreted, uh, expecting to be part of the urine, and things that are brought back in are saved from leaving the body, so we're reabsorbing those. It's a lower pressure capillary and it feeds into a venule that feeds into the cortical radiant vein. Now notice this particular nephron has a very short loop of Henle. And our illustrators tried to emphasize that the paratubular capillaries are wrapped around this, but it can drape over this part as well. The reason they've isolated this is because they wanted to show us a second type of nephron. Notice with the second type of nephron, it has a massive loop of Henle that goes deep into the medulla. And notice here, we have this kind of lattice or ladder-shaped capillary that wraps around it. And this ladder or lattice-shaped capillary that just wraps around this extensive loop of Henle is what is known as the vasa recta. Now notice they didn't put a paratubular capillary on this one but this one absolutely will have a paratubular capillary as well. So again, what our artist has tried to represent here is the paratubulars is on the proximal convoluted tubules on the small loops of Henle, the vasa rectas are just on the long ones, but that's not an either or situation. There are plenty of these that have both, would have both a paratubular and a vasa recta. All right, excellent. 
Last thing, and here I love, you know how I love these electron microscopy views from your textbook, but I like this one in particular, I think because these little things look like brains and BNA, neuroanatomy style of anything that looks like a brain. But what I love about this picture is that this is an electron microscopy view just of the blood vessels. And notice here, we really get a sense in the difference of our two main capillaries. These brain looking structures are the glomeruli. Notice they're capillaries that must be tightly packed inside of Bowman's capsule. So Bowman's capsule, which obviously we can't see, wraps around this, keeping it in that tight, tight bundle. However, these much looser open capillaries are the ones that would wrap around the paratubular, I mean, would wrap around the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. So these are the paratubular capillaries. In fact, notice, and they've highlighted this on the pretty picture, here would be the cortical radiant artery feeding into the afferent arteriole, which feeds into a uh, glomerulus, which feeds out into the efferent arteriole, which feeds into the big loose paratubular capillary. Now, why they put this on the bottom of the screen instead of just flipping this image and putting it at the top, who knows? But one of the cool things about it is you can see that relationship between these structures. Uh, the afferent arteriole into the glomerulus, the efferent arteriole into the paratubular capillary. So there you go. That is the anatomy of our nephron. And again, here's the pretty picture that goes along with this. Here we have a paratubular capillary around uh, the glomerulus, right? the efferent arteriole and the vasa recta, the four blood vessel structures, and the four tubular structures, Bowman's capsule, the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, the four components of our tubular components of our nephron. All right, and as we can kind of hint at, you would see that there are two primary types of nephrons, those that have the short loops of Henle, that just barely penetrate, or in some cases don't penetrate into the medulla at all, and those with the big, huge, extensive loops of Henle that go all the way down. The majority, 85% of our nephrons, are the ones with the short loops of Henle, and those are called cortical nephrons. The ones with the super long loops of Henle, notice they only make up 15%, but when you're talking about over a million of these, 15% is still a massively large number. These with the extensive loops of Henle that go deep into the medullary cav, I mean, to the medullary pyramids are known as the juxtamedullary nephrons, which of course is a term I'm certain you will have to spell at some point during the exam. These with the long extensive loops of Henle, remember the loops of Henle are what affect the osmolarity of our urine and the concentration of our urine. So these juxtamedullary nephrons help us to produce both our dilute and our versus our concentrated urine, and they affect the osmolarity of it as well. And I think I have one more pretty picture. Here we go. Notice here's our cortical, and again, this is a more uh, accurate uh, illustration. With our cortical nephrons, the paratubular capillary will cover the loop of Henle, as well as the proximal and the distal convoluted tubules. Whereas with a uh, juxtamedullary nephron. Here we see that we have a paratubular capillary around the proximal and distal convoluted tubules, and then that lattice like or drape like capillary over the extensive loops of Henle. And there's one more place where we can see this as well. Actually, there's a couple more places, but the last one I'm going to show you for right now. If we go back to, where'd it go? Here. If we go back to this picture, and we go back to this one here, and let's cheat and get rid of the pictures. Notice here, as we saw here, when we look at the blood vessels, we saw all of the tubular components that were here. Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule. And now we can see this is representing a cortical nephron, and this is a juxtamedullary nephron. But notice also they've represented the blood vessels for us here as well. Notice we have our afferent arteriole feeding into the glomerulus. 
we have our efferent arterioles feeding out. And notice these structures here represent the paratubular capillaries. Notice they'd be fed into a red end and coming out blue end. So again, these are representing those paratubular capillaries. However, notice down here deep in the medulla, we have a more lattice appearance capillary. That would be the one that would be associated with these long loops of Henle. Basically, all they've done is separated the structures here so we see them independently. Here's our paratubular capillaries. Here's our vasa recta. So not only does this model show all of our tubular components of the nephron, but it shows us all of the blood vessel components of the nephron as well. The glomerulus, the efferent arteriole, the paratubular capillary, and the vasa recta. They've just separated them so that we can see them independently. All righty, questions on that? I talked for a long time, I apologize for that. Let me take a look at our lecture. Where are we at with this? Um, where do we go next? A little bit of more anatomy. All right, there's only a little bit more left, but I have talked for a long period of time, and if nothing else, when we come back, we can review this one more time. So I apologize for going a little longer. It just was, there wasn't a natural stopping point for this, uh, but uh, we don't have a lot more to do, but I do wanna do a lot more with the anatomy and the histology. So let's go ahead and uh, take a, a break. We'll go ahead and take a 15 minute break, come back at uh, 11.10. And 11.10, we will pick up from there. I know it's close to 11.30, but remember, we start at 8. We didn't start at 7, so I get you till 12.30 if I need it. Uh, but let's take, a, we don't have maybe 20, 25 more minutes of stuff. So I'll tell you what, let's just take a quick 10-minute break. 10-minute break, come back at 5 after, so 11.05, and we will pick up from there. So let me go ahead and uh, pause the recording. Recording. All righty. <clears throat> Any questions before we dive back in? All right, then like I said, what we need to do is a little bit more of a quick review of the material we've already talked about. Again, here we have some of the great pictures that we mentioned for our glomerulus. Here we can see those nice fenestrations, those pores that we have on it. But here we get a great illustration. Again, I, you know how much I love to make fun of our um, uh, make fun of our um, illustrators for doing a poor job of showing these things. But here we get this big centrally located cell body, and we have these big long foot-like processes that stick out that give the podocytes their names. And their job is twofold. One is to provide additional support and structure to our a glomerulus, remember the glomerulus is still a capillary. It's still a single simple squamous epithelial tissue and a little bit of a basement membrane and that's it. But the pressure in it is almost double what it is in a normal capillary. So it needs a little extra support and structure to it. Also with these fenestrations, it is very porous. So a lot of materials are able to come out. So the other things that this foot-like processes do is they form these spaces called the filtration slits. And these filtration slips help to limit what is capable of coming out of the capillary. So they help to play a role in the formation of the filtrate as well. Again, the illustration is really beautiful. They kind of make it look this way. But of course, you look at it, and you think there's no way it could actually look that way. And then you look at it in this electron microscope. In this electron microscope uh, view, it is colorized. So they're not this normal, uh, beautiful green color that we see here. But here we can clearly see these big, huge, large foot-like processes that come off of the podocytes, and then the tiny little filtration slits that are in between them. So this really is what it looks like, and it is very, very cool looking uh, when you get the chance to, uh, to look at this uh, in this uh, great illustration. So we see that there. All right. Um, the last two things we need to talk about is then kind of em em <coughs> excuse me, emphasize this place where filtrate is being made. Where the filtrate then is being made, basically we have a filtration membrane. Kind of like we had a, 
uh, you know, that respiration zone had a respiration membrane made up of the simple squamous epithelial tissue of the capillary and the simple squamous epithelial tissue of the alveolus. Well, here we basically have a filtration membrane as well. It is comprised of the fenestration, fenestrated, notably here, fenestrated, uh, simple squamous epithelial tissue or endothelium of our capillary. And again, in this case, it's not a pulmonary capillary, it's the glomerular capillary that we have here. And here we have those foot-like processes of those podocytes. Again, the spaces in between form the filtration slits. So we see the filtration slits there. And then as you can see, we basically just have the basement membrane that is holding these two things together. So when we look at the anatomy, of this filtration membrane where, and again, notice it says where the urine formation begins. Remember at this point, we are not making urine, we are making filtrate, but this is where it begins. And it is, whoops, what happened there? Uh, it is comprised of these three components. So again, we have the fenestrated endothelium, of the glomerulus, We have our uh, podocyte foot-like processes. And then we have the basement membrane. Or again, we can always uh, use the fancy term basal lamina. holding them together. And basically that forms the openings, the spaces, uh, that is gonna limit what comes out during the filtrate. All right. So no new information here, just a different view, a different way of thinking at and looking at these things. There is one more bit of new anatomy we need to talk about. And that is the regulation of the nephron. If you think about way back when we talked about the respiratory system all of you know last week, um, one of the things we concepts we talked about was the idea of that ventilation perfusion coupling, right? Because there are millions upon millions of alveoli in our lungs, at each alveoli the conditions of the gases are not going to be identical. And so at each individual alveolus, we monitor the conditions of the oxygen, we monitor the conditions of the carbon dioxide, so we can change the dynamics that we're taking on place there to optimize the efficiency of our gas exchange. Well, it's gonna be the same thing here as well. If we have 25% of our blood going to our kidneys each minute and a million plus nephrons in each kidney, the condition of each individual nephron and what each individual nephron is going to be doing is not identical. So we again need that auto regulation where we are going to be able to locally be able to monitor the conditions of how each nephron is working to maximize its efficiency. And to do that, we need a specialized regulatory structure. Again, it's gonna be associated with each renal corpuscle independently. It's gonna to help to monitor and change the filtration rate. Let's talk about why this is important, right? Anyone who's ever seen, you know, I Love Lucy before, one of the classic episodes is when she's sitting there at the candy conveyor belt. And her job is to check the candy, put it in the little, piece of paper or whatever it is. And notice as more and more candy comes down, it gets harder and harder for her to do her job. And that's the issue. Remember our job, our goal here is to process the blood. That, right? That is gonna be, we want to process the blood. We want to process the, uh, clean the blood. Let's actually make it more specific. We want to clean the blood, make the blood appropriate. And the way we do that is by processing 
the filtering. And herein lies the problem. If you think of it this way, if we produce too much filtrate, then the problem with that, let me give myself room to be able to write this. The problem with that is that we're not gonna have enough time to process it correctly. Right, that's the I Love Lucy episode where the candy's coming down the conveyor belt too fast. She's not able to deal with it. So she starts shoving it in her mouth or sticking it in her dress or whatever else she's doing. She's not gonna have enough time to process it. And if that occurs, our filtrate is gonna be under processed. And that is a bad thing. But the opposite can be a bad thing as well. If on the other hand, we do not produce enough or we produce to little filtrate, then the process goes too slow. And what happens is we have too much time And if we have too much time to process it, we are going to over process it. Right. One of the most mystical and magical places in the whole wide world is of course, as you know, the Jelly Belly Factory, just down 80 from us. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to go. Obviously you can't go now, but hopefully once things get better, if you haven't gone, I highly recommend going. It's a very fun tour. And one of the cool things about the Jelly Belly Factory is that they have a quality control. They have people there that inspect the uh, jelly beans as they come through. And if the jelly bean has a wrong shape or if two of them are stuck together or something like that, then those are pulled out. They don't, they don't meet the criteria that are set and they end up in these big bags of flops. The flops look ugly, but they taste just like the regular ones and they're like a half of the price. You can get a massive bag of them for like $3 or whatever it is. And so buying those flops is a tremendous amount of fun, right? Because you get cheap jelly beans. And who doesn't love cheap jelly beans? However, if you have too much time, if you have five minutes to inspect every single jelly bean that comes down the line, then you're gonna over process it and you're gonna nitpick it and you're gonna be over processing it and pulling things out that normally would make it through. And that can be a bad thing as well. So our key to our nephron is, it's again, more is not always better. So we don't wanna under process it, we don't wanna over process it. And so we need to maintain the rate, an appropriate rate. And so that's really our goal. Our goal is to maintain an appropriate rate of filtrate formation. That's going to be our goal. So that it's not over-processed and it's not under-processed. And so to do that, each individual nephron, because each individual nephron is going to do this independently, each individual nephron is going to have its own specialized structure that allows that to occur. Oh, don't know what that is. Ah, this is what I want. Ah, okay. I don't know what's going on there. All right, so we'll get rid of the pretty picture that I, I mean, so that. So here in our uh, glomerulus, here we see it more closely. It, we can see the specialized structures we haven't identified yet that are going to be our specialized regulatory structures. These specialized regulatory structures together are known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So again, this is the structure that maintains the appropriate rate of filtration. And the juxtaglomerulus apparatus is comprised of three types of cells. And those three types of cells form three main structures. The first of them, I'm gonna go ahead and write them out here and then we'll go and look at the pretty pictures and all the pretty words that do a job of showing this. The first of these are what are known as the macula densa cells.
With our macula densa cells, one of the things that we will see and notice here, let's emphasize it and change color. We have a piece of our distal convoluted tubule. You may not have noticed, but when we go back to the illustrations, we will see or the models, uh, the illustrations, and even the histology, hopefully we'll be able to see it. Uh, the distal convoluted tubule always comes back towards the renal corpuscle. And the reason it comes back is basically these macula densa cells are our quality control. And if you're making a product, then basically near the end of the process, you want to check the quality control of that product. Our product here is of course going to be our urine. At this point it's filtrate. And at this point here in the distal convoluted tubule, it is mostly urine. It's not fully urine yet, but it is almost urine. I like that better, let's do that. Almost urine. It's close, but it's almost urine. And so what that means is now is a good time where we can check to see whether it is over or under processed. To do that, we have these macula densa cells. Now notice when we look at the anatomy, we know our distal convoluted tubule is comprised of simple cuboidal uh, epithelial cells. Our macula densa cells though, are tightly packed columnar cells. Oops. Columnar cells. And these tightly packed columnar cells contain chemo and osmo receptors. Basically, their job is to check the condition of our almost urine. Are we under processing it or are we over processing it or are we processing it just right? And that's our goal, to check to see if we're processing it just right. If not, if we're over-processing or under-processing it, then they are gonna to communicate to the other cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus so that we can change the conditions. So this is our quality control. Here, right here, these tightly packed cells are our quality control. These are our macula densa cells, all right? Now, let's take, for instance, the example that our uh, filtrate is being over-processed. We're not producing enough filtrate. Well, one of the things we're gonna need to do then is bring more blood to our glomerulus. And so the way that our macula densa cells are going to do that, and actually we should say this here, our macula densa cells release nitric oxide. All right, that nitrous oxide is how it is gonna communicate with the other two cells of our juxtaglomerular apparatus. The second cell of our juxtaglomerular apparatus are what are known as uh, the juxtaglomerular cells. You have to spell juxtaglomerular for the apparatus anyway. So calling them juxtaglomerular cells is totally fine. And let's put a two at the beginning of this so we know this is our second cell. Of course, once you spell out juxtaglomerular cell once, you are then able to abbreviate it JG cells. However, the other name, and again, you need to be able to recognize juxtaglomerular cells and know what that means. But the other thing these juxtaglomerular cells are called is they are also referred to as granular cells. And that is an acceptable name that you can use for them. Notice first where these granular cells are located. These granular cells are located around the afferent arteriole. So notice here, oops, uh, that. These enlarged cells on the outer surface of our afferent arteriole 
are the juxtaglomerular cells or the granular cells. They're called granular cells because they are smooth muscle cells. But these are smooth muscle cells that also make hormones and proteins. Of course, being smooth muscle cells, they are able to uh, change the diameter. of the afferent arteriole right? so that they can change the diameter, increase and decrease in the diameter, which would increase and decrease the flow. So that's going to affect the flow of blood into them. But they also contain a large number of vesicles. And that's where they make the hormones and proteins. And that's actually where they get their name. They get the name granule cells uh, because they contain a large number of vesicles. And so they have a granular appearance to them. So let's go back to as we were talking about our uh, distal convoluted tubule with our macula densa cells decide, hey, we are over processing the filtrate. That means we're not getting enough filtrate made, which means we need more blood coming into the glomerulus. What these macula densa cells will do is release more nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide causes smooth muscle to dilate. And when we dilate that, that is gonna bring more blood to the glomerulus. More blood means more filtrate. Conversely, if we're under processing our filtrate, then that means we're making too much filtrate. And our macula densa cells notice that. They release less nitric oxide, and that causes our juxtaglomerular cells to constrict. Less nitric oxide means less relaxation. We constrict. That decreases blood flow to the glomerulus. And as we decrease blood flow to the glomerulus, we make less filtrate. So by having our quality control communicate with our granular cells, we can directly affect how much blood is coming in, and that can directly affect how much filtrate we produce. So obviously, the more blood that comes in, the more filtrate we're going to produce. The less blood that comes in, the less filtrate we're going to produce. However, notice also intertwined within our glomerulus are our third cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and these are known as the mesangeal cells. Now notice some of these are located outside of the glomerulus, some of them are inside of the glomerulus. We're not going to worry about distinguishing these. These are not muscle cells. I want to make sure to emphasize that. but they do contain a large amount of actin. Oops. Actin, of course, as we learned in the muscular system, <clears throat> is an important contractile protein. And that contractile protein is what helps us to move our muscle through space. But if you also remember back to 430, Actin was one of the cytoskeletal structures, uh, the actin filaments, that allow cells to move dynamically. Uh, we talked about the example of a nerve cell, how when a nerve cell grows from your spinal cord out to your big toe, it sends out this growth cone with these long extensions of actin. And that's what our mesangeal cells do. They're not growing from one location to another, but what they can do, we can build up a large number of actin filaments, or we can break actin down. Actin is a very dynamic protein. And so what these cells can do is the cells can expand and shrink. Let's say it that way, because I don't want to say contract, but we can, they can expand and they can shrink by producing more actin or less actin. So again, they're able to expand if they produce more actin. 
they can shrink if they produce less actin, and so they can change their shape. So let's think about this. Let's, hold on, I need to move my chat window out of the way so I can do this. We have a cell, one of these mesangeal cells, and let's go ahead and draw it right here. This mesangeal cell that is located right in this region. What it is able to do using actin is actin, it can expand its shape and this cell can become bigger. If you think about it, as this cell becomes bigger, what it does is it pushes the uh, pieces of the glomerulus outer, outwards, right? And the way you can experience this is by making a fist. If you make a fist and you think of the surface area of your fingers, a lot of your fingers are coiled up inside of your fist and aren't really exposed. However, as you start to point your fingers and expand your fist outward, then the surface of your area of your hand becomes bigger. And that's what happens here. As these uh, mesangeal cells produce more actin and expand, the cells get bigger and they push the uh, coils of the glomerulus outward. And as they push the coils of the glomerulus outward, when they expand, we get more surface area. Right? And of course, when they contract, we get less surface area. So basically, this changes the amount of surface area that our glomerulus has, where we can get more surface area or less surface area. And of course, if we have more surface area, we're going to produce more filtrate. And if we have less surface area, we're going to produce less filtrate because there's less surface area for that filtrate production to occur. So if we again go back to those mesangeal cells, the mesangeal cells see that we are overproducing the filtrate. So again, as we talked about, they release nitrous oxide. And in this case, that nitrous oxide uh, causes the mesangeal cells to produce more actin that expands the glomerulus, increase in the surface area, and more filtrate is gonna be produced, right? Because if we're over-processing it, then we're not making enough filtrate. So our quality control controls how much blood is coming into our glomerulus, and it also controls the surface area of the glomerulus. And so by controlling both, it controls how much filtrate we make. And so on a dynamic moment by moment, nephron by nephron level, we can make sure that we're always producing the right amount of filtrate at the right rate. And that is the job of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Again, I've drawn, I've written it all out here. Let's go ahead and erase that and then look at the same pretty pictures uh, with and words from your lecture. So again, we have the macula densa cells in the distal convoluted tubule, tightly packed together. They contain the special chemo and osmo receptors, and there are quality control. We have our juxtaglomerular cells or JG cells or granular cells. Again, you can only use JG after you've written out juxtaglomerular once. But on a lab exam, if I pointed at one of these and asked you to identify them, granular would be an acceptable answer. These wrap only around the afferent arteriole. And again, they're smooth muscle cells, but have the ability to produce hormones or hormone-like proteins. So they have an endocrine component, and those vesicles of those hormones and proteins are why they have a granular appearance. And lastly, we have the mesangeal cells. Again, some outside of the glomerulus, some inside the glomerulus, you don't have to dis worry about distinguishing those. But they contain that contractile actin filament that again is not, whoops, is not uh, contracting these. These are not muscle cells that are contracting, but remember actin can be used to dynamically change the shape of the cell. So in this case, we can expand the cell or we can uh, decrease the size of the cell uh, to increase or decrease surface area. All right, and so again, these three things collectively are the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now, notice the illustration here shows this nicely, but let's go back 
to that uh, tribe plaque that I mentioned here with the tribe plaque. Notice here, we can actually see this as well. They don't quite give us the view. I wonder if they got us another picture. Nope, they don't. This is the only picture they've given us. All right, so um, what we can see here is notice here we see a little bit of our distal convoluted tubule. Notice we didn't talk about it on the previous picture, but notice here in all of our, both of our nephrons, the distal convoluted tubule comes right back here, right next to the afferent arteriole. Distal convoluted tubule comes right back here, right to, next to our afferent arteriole. And that's what we're seeing here. This little bit right here is that little bit of distal convoluted tubule coming right back next to the afferent arteriole. And if you look closely, you can see that these are more columnar looking cells. These columnar looking cells would then be the macula densa cells. They communicate with these cells, which would be the granular cells. Notice our afferent arteriole is easy to distinguish from our efferent because it's much thicker. And the reason it's much thicker is because it has these massive number of granular cells here on their surface. And then notice here in these spaces would be where the mesangeal cells are. Notice our model does not show the mesangeal cells. Uh, because, but if we, you know, had some spaces and there's some great illustrations that show them, but here these spaces would be where the mesangeal cells are located. So the mesangeal cells, the granular cells, and the macula densa cells can, well, at least the macula densa and the granular cells can be seen on our model. We know where the mesangeal cells would be located. The last thing that I want to show you, and for this we need to go back to the histology, Excellent. That's not bad, but let me see if I got a better one. No, uh, no, they only have the one picture. All right, excellent. Notice, as we talked about, we have these proximal convoluted tubules with the cloudy lumens, and then the distal convoluted tubules with the a clear uh, uh, lumen to it. This particular one, notice there are a lot more nuclei right here. What I will tell you right now is this, in my opinion, is not a good example of this, and I would not use this picture on the exam. However, as you explore the almighty Google, uh, especially if you put in macula densa histology, what you'll see is that while we have these uh, more spaced out uh, simple cuboidal cells, notice there's a large number of nuclei tightly packed together. So we have that tightly packed nuclei there. This represents, as the illustration shows us, that macula densa. It's always going to be right next to the renal corpuscle. Uh, so we'll be able to see that. Again, like I said, this is not what I would consider a good example. They're correct. This is the macula densa, and the density of the uh, nuclei are what give that away. But I will tell you that when you look at the histology, there are going to be a lot better much more obvious examples that we'll be able to see at places. Uh, so that is definitely something you'd be responsible for histologically, all those macula densa cells. But like I said, I would give you a much better example of it than this. But it is something that can be seen histologically. Uh, maybe I'll try to find a nice histology picture for our next lecture on Wednesday. All right, actually let me write that down so that I will do that. And I also want to show you the vasa recta histologically, which is also something you will be responsible for, which I don't think they do a good job. Yeah, they don't do a good job of showing that to you here. So I'll have both of those things for you histologically in the next class uh, so that you can see those, because I guarantee those are going to think, be things you'll be responsible for on the exam. All right. So here we've seen those structures. Now we've seen both the gross anatomy and the microscopic anatomy. We've seen it on the models. We've seen it on the histology. And we've worked our way all the way down to those regulatory cells uh, that we see on each individual nephron that form the juxtaglomerular apparatus. With that, we are done with all of the anatomy of the urinary system, uh, well, at least of the kidney of the urinary system. We obviously still have the urinary tract, but I think what we'll do is process our urine first, make our urine, and then we'll look at the uh, urinary tract. Because like I said, the urinary tract's sole function 
is just to receive and store the urine. They don't process it, they don't do anything else other than house it and release it from the body. So I think what we'll move on to next is the physiology of what's going on in the kidney and what's going on here in the nephron. All right, so that is everything that I have for us for uh, today. Uh, so again, we'll do a brief anatomy review at the beginning of the class on Wednesday, and then we're gonna dive into the physiology to make sure we understand how this works. All right, so any questions on any of this before we finish for today? This is your last chance to ask questions uh, before we call it quits. So any questions on any of the anatomy that we've talked about? All right, well, either you are all asleep or you've all mastered this material. Either way, it's excellent. Get your rest, it is important to do that, or hopefully you understood this material. Well, that is all I have for today. I'm gonna to go ahead and stop the recording then if there are no more questions. I will hang out for a few more minutes, the next five or 10 minutes, so if you think of anything else or have some question that you didn't want uh, recorded or personal question or something like that, you have that opportunity to be able to ask that. Otherwise, I, I will get this posted. Again, it's a nice long lecture, so it may take me a bit of time to get it up, but it'll definitely be up today. Uh, so otherwise, have a good day. Be safe. Take care of yourselves. Uh, and I will see you on Wednesday. Have a good week.